green special interest tax breaks in the President's so-called Inflation Reduction Act. In the eight months since that law's passage, three things are clear. Number one, taxpayers are footing a bill for these tax breaks that are hundreds of billions above what they were told. Some estimates reach as high as one trillion, over three times more than originally estimated. Other economists estimate the battery manufacturing credits alone will cost over 196 billion, a 542% increase, 542% increase. Number two, the White House opened up convenient loopholes to make not only foreign countries, but even our adversaries like China eligible to claim these taxpayer funded subsidies. And number three, the design of these credits has allowed large companies, big banks, and the already wealthy to make billions off the backs of hardworking American taxpayers. Ultimately, the White House and my colleagues on the other side push through these corporate welfare subsidies that cost more than three times as much as they told us it would while paying big dividends to big business in China. While the wealthy and politically connected get a massive windfall from the Democrats' taxpayer subsidized handouts, working families, small business owners, and farmers, they're struggling. Witnesses at Ways and Means Field hearings have told us of the challenges they face to hire, make payroll, afford input materials because of the president's inflation crisis. I anticipate we will hear more of these challenging stories at our hearing Friday in Georgia. President Biden, he may succeed in strengthening the manufacturing sector, but for China, not the US. Solar cells manufactured in China and assembled into panels in the U.S. will qualify for these special interest tax breaks, even if they are implicated in human rights abuses. The world's largest solar manufacturer is a Chinese company that just had its solar shipments confiscated at the border last fall over forced labor concerns. They are now planning to partner with a business in Ohio to utilize these very credits to build a facility here in the United States. Are these the type of businesses that we should be rewarding? This is just one area where the Biden administration has opened the door to China. To develop projects like EV battery manufacturing, U.S. companies are partner partnering with Chinese Communist Party controlled companies that control over 50% of the processing capacity of key battery ingredients. Meanwhile, White House regulations and red tape make it difficult for America to develop critical resources for EV battery ingredients right here at home. As congressional scorekeepers now realize this money will get spent faster than expected. The Biden administration is creating even new loopholes to benefit foreign companies and foreign workers. The latest example is the administration's new critical minerals agreement with Japan that evades IRA safeguards and allows benefits to flow to foreign companies. No wonder USTR did not let the American people see the text of the agreement before signing it. This is a low emission tax subsidy fire sale only Washington and Wall Street would love. These special political tax breaks flow to big companies and big banks with congressional scorekeepers estimating that large corporations today receive over 90% of them. These are companies with cells in excess of $1 billion. 
Financial institutions receive three times more than any other industry. Financial institutions receive three times as any industry. That's correct. And when it comes to the 15% minimum tax on corporations that Democrats touted last year to look tough on big business and to make sure everyone pays their fair share, that's what they say. But guess what? They exempted their special interest tax breaks from that rule creating a loophole for their friends, their donors, their buddies, and politically favored corporations. American workers should not have to send money to Washington in order to subsidize big corporate virtue signaling about climate commitments and woke agendas. We cannot ignore these facts among misleading marketing about good intentions and climate change. Democrats sold America a bill of goods with the Inflation Reduction Act, and the sad part is, once again, America and the American worker will pay the price. I now turn to Ms. Chu for the purpose of an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for gathering us to discuss how in just eight months, the Inflation Reduction Act has done more for American workers and families than the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act has done in almost six years. The climate crisis is real, and its effects are only becoming more extreme. In California, all but one of the state's 10 largest wildfires in history have occurred since 2017, and years of severe drought have now been followed by months of extreme rain and snow. Democrats did something about this. And we made sure that the clean energy transition will mean more jobs, more manufacturing, and higher wages here in the United States. The Inflation Reduction Act is the single largest clean energy investment in U.S. history. With first-of-their-kind requirements to strengthen American supply chains and create quality, high-paying jobs, this legislation is proving that Green jobs are good jobs, and putting the country on a path to responsible, sustainable energy independence. So far, the green tax credits have spurred over 100,000 jobs for U.S. electricians, mechanics, construction workers, technicians, support staff, and others. Just in the law's first six months, 90 new clean energy projects have been announced in 31 states. These projects include battery manufacturing, electric vehicle manufacturing, and wind and solar manufacturing sites. If this isn't delivering results for the American people, then what is? Along with the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and the Chips and Science Act, these landmark laws have led to companies committing more than $200 billion to U.S. manufacturing. Our investments in semiconductor and clean tech investments are nearly double what they were in 2021 and nearly 20 times the total in 2019. The result is less reliance on vulnerable supply chains overseas and offshoring of well-paying jobs, just another way that Democrats are growing the economy from the bottom up and the middle out. Meanwhile, Republicans are over 100 days into the Congress, and the American people can see that their priorities include shielding tax cheats from accountability, proposing a 30% tax increase on everything Americans buy, and threatening to drag the country into an unnecessary economic crisis that would decimate Social Security and Medicare. What we have not seen is any plan that would reinvest in American workers and families. If they were serious about these goals, they would support the Inflation Reduction Act's work to onshore critical supply chains and revitalize communities. But instead, we get hearings like this one, which use China as a way to distract from their own policy failures. It is dishonest because the truth is that the Inflation Reduction Act is one of the most impactful laws in our nation's history to reduce our reliance on China and other foreign markets and move jobs and supply chains back here 
to the United States. And it is reckless and false rhetoric that has consequences. As, we, as we've seen since the pandemic, this rhetoric contributes to dangerous anti-Asian hate that hurts Asian Americans here in the United States. In the last 100 days, notwithstanding all their America First rhetoric, one of the most consistent themes of our committee's majority has been to put foreign interests ahead of the American people. Last month, we marked up a bill in this committee that would put the interest of foreign bondholders, including Chinese bondholders, ahead of veterans, seniors in Medicaid uh, that are in nursing homes, Pell Grant recipients, and every American awaiting a tax refund. And this is a pattern. The Republican tax scam gave more benefit to foreign investors than the bottom 60% of Americans. We didn't hear any America First concerns at that time. I'm disappointed that we are once again spending valuable time on political posturing against our clear successes instead of working together to create American jobs, shore up our domestic supply chains, or catapult our nation to leading in the new green energy economy. It's a waste of our time, a waste of the American people's time, and it's all in the service of extending another round of handouts to the wealthy and well-connected. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Ms. Hugh. Uh, I want to welcome the witnesses and thank you for um, taking your time out to be before the, the best committee in Congress, the House Ways and Means Committee. Um, I'll now uh, be pleased to introduce each and every one of you. Daniel Turner is the founder and executive director of, of Power the Future. Drew Horn is the founder and CEO of Green Met and formerly uh, Associate Director of Policy for the Office of the Vice President. Kenny Stein is Policy Director at the Institute for Energy Research. And Vance um, Ginn is Senior Fellow at Americans for Tax Reform and formerly the Chief Economist at the Office of Management and Budget. And Ben Beachy is Vice President of Manufacturing and Industrial Policy at the Blue Green Alliance. Mr. Turner, you're now recognized. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Smith, Ranking Member Neal, members of the Ways and Means Committee, good morning and thank you for the opportunity to appear before you. My name is Daniel Turner and I am the founder of Power the Future, a group that advocates for the millions of energy workers, especially those in rural America. These men and women produce the energy which powers our homes and our nation and their jobs are under constant attack. Energy undergirds everything from our economy to our national security. Everything grown, manufactured, transported requires energy. And as energy prices go up, food and consumer goods have become more expensive. Our current state of high inflation is driven largely by administrative actions designed to significantly raise the cost of fossil fuels. No one has been hit harder than working class and rural Americans. We are producing less oil than we have in years because we have an administration that has promised no new drilling. As a result, gas prices are still nearly $1.50 higher on average than when President Biden took office. The proposed government solution? A $7,500 tax rebate on new electric vehicles. For most Americans who cannot afford an EV, which averages $60,000, that is not clearly a solution at all. So who is benefiting from these tax rebates? Data shows the average EV owner earns over $100,000, more than double the average salary. The tax benefits for going green are anything but equitable. The other beneficiary is the Chinese government. My organization has previously authored two studies, one showing how 70% of EVs and green technology are manufactured in China, the other showing how 90 to 95 percent of the rare earth elements in those technologies are sourced from markets dominated by China. As a consequence, every tax break, subsidy, or government program meant to incentivize the purchase of EVs is really a direct benefit to China. It does not have to be this way. President Biden has spoken often about a supply chain that starts in America, a goal with which I wholeheartedly agree. 
Yet along with that lofty rhetoric comes a sobering truth. Efforts to open the U.S. mines needed for the green supply chain have been thwarted. Mines in Minnesota, Arizona, Alaska, and many other states are stopped while the Biden administration has made deals for these same materials from foreign countries, some of which have records of slavery and child labor and disastrous environmental practices. Yes, the metals and the rare earths to quote unquote go green are still needed, but the jobs and the tax revenue are being outsourced rather than coming to Americans. I have been to Alaskan native villages fighting the government to open a mine where the unemployment rate currently runs around 80%, where mothers pour soda into their babies' bottles because milk, if they can even find it, costs $12 a half gallon and there is no running water. These communities are pleading for the mine to open, for the jobs, electricity, infrastructure, but most of all, the dignity and hope. These communities deserve the chance to utilize their land for their much needed benefit. And we've done this for decades to coal communities. All across America, the war on coal has closed mines and plunged once thriving communities into poverty. Radical environmental groups, many of whom have been investigated for their ties to Russian and Chinese funding, launch glitzy ad campaigns to close coal mines. And when they win, they return to their headquarters and leave those, those towns struggling with systemic poverty. Yet we still use coal. It's just more expensive. And eventually, like the metals and the rare earths, it will be imported from other countries where child and slaver labor often mine it. Fossil fuels are not going away. The government is just making them more expensive and as a result, making life more expensive. The burdens grow harder. The natural gas tax this Congress passed last year will not have companies quote unquote pay their fair share as proponents claim. The American people will just face higher costs. Even the discussed bans on gas stoves and gas hot water heaters will do nothing for climate change. They will just make life harder for struggling Americans. I am here today to talk about policies that unleash American energy and by extension, American prosperity and the American dream. I look forward to taking your questions and having a robust and honest conversation. Thank you, Mr. Turner. Mr. Horn, you're now recognized. Thank you, Chairman Smith, members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Drew Horn, and I am president and CEO of GreenMet, a private company working to develop American critical mineral and green energy supply chains. I am here today to explore the connection between our domestic energy supply chain policy and our national security. The intent of the Inflation Reduction Act, signed by the president in 2022, was to invest in companies whose focus is domestic energy production and manufacturing. As we have seen in recent headlines, Implementation of the IRA has been inconsistent with congressional intent. The Treasury Department is responsible for ensuring compliance with the IRA. It is imperative the Treasury close loopholes that currently enable foreign adversaries to circumvent U.S. law. Treasury has already announced guidance pertaining to the qualification of critical mineral requirements, highlighting the need for supply chain transparency and sourcing requirements. However, industry stakeholders are still waiting for Treasury guidance on what countries qualify as a foreign entity of concern. In the meantime, Chinese-backed companies are taking advantage of U.S. tax credits by establishing quasi-Chinese subsidiaries on U.S. soil within U.S. supply chains. Nationwide, industry and financial leaders are waking up to the threat that this presents to America and to our allies. Chinese dominance and continued incursion of our energy supply chains is the most significant national security threat that the United States and other friendly countries are facing in the 21st century. I want to emphasize the fact that when Chinese-backed companies are allowed to do business inside the U.S., we must assume Chinese intelligence agencies are illegally collecting sensitive U.S. information, stealing intellectual property, and doing everything they can to continue Chinese Communist Party dominance in this sector. In effect, a Trojan horse is introduced into our nation's industrial and manufacturing sectors. The CCP's approach is to conceal its ownership or influence. U.S. companies and universities that present themselves as homegrown domestic entities dedicated to promoting U.S. commercial and national interests is one method of that disguise. In some instances, Chinese-backed companies or universities have filed for and were actually granted U.S. government funding, 
all of this is supported by CCP national policies. Current U.S. control mechanisms, like CFIUS, are insufficient to protect U.S. industry from this subterfuge. I emphatically urge each federal agency and department to take this issue seriously by, one, defining foreign entities of concern, two, solidifying congressional free trade agreements with our allied partners, and three, investing in true American companies. Doing all these things will secure and diversify America's supply chains. To begin, Congress should push Treasury to provide clear definitions of foreign entities of concern. Look to current law for our national defense industrial base, which prohibits acquisition of sensitive materials from non-allied foreign nations in the interest of national security. Foreign entities of concern should match the definition of covered nations as defined in U.S. law. The case for applying this definition to our domestic mineral supply chains is now. Next, Congress should continue to play an active role in ratifying ongoing free trade agreements and giving clear mandates for cooperation with allies. At any point, the PRC may limit global access by restricting trade of these critical minerals, all of which have China as the dominant global mineral and metal producer. Therefore, trade policy plays a key role in decreasing our import reliance on foreign entities of concern. In the short term, the U.S. will need to engage with allies and free trade partners to secure our mineral supply chains. The solidification of free trade partnerships, even with the current patchwork of agreements, ensures our continual cooperation with longstanding allies and buys us time to bring more American supply online. And finally, we all must commit to building domestic supply chains, thereby reducing our reliance on other nations. I truly believe this is a bipartisan issue and one that affects the entire industry. We must incentivize true U.S. alternatives to support our national security and policy goals. Our energy security is our national security. Strong policy will continue to de-risk domestic energy production, creating pathways for willing Wall Street investors and patriotic companies to unleash American energy production again. Domestic options, when paired with the right mix of prudent government support and time, can organically grow without foreign interference. We must control our own destiny, but the window of opportunity to rebuild domestic supply chains is closing if we don't take action now. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Horn. Mr. Stein, you're recognized. Mr. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity to testify at this hearing. Um, the subsidies in the misnamed Inflation Reduction Act, which we are examining today, are worse than merely misguided industrial policy because the industries sing singled out for the most generous subsidy, which namely the wind, solar, and batteries industries, are not actually domestic industries. The inputs and components that will build the subsidized green energy system envisioned by the IRA will be coming from foreign countries, especially China, which thoroughly dominates both the solar and battery industries and is a major part of the wind industry. The IRA thus discards even the usual justifications for industrial policies, such as domestic industry or security. Uh, the, this green industrial policy actually seeks to destroy domestic energy and replace it with foreign energy. The policy set forward in the IRA will tax our children to pay for China for green energy to replace the oil, natural gas, and coal that we currently produce here in the United States. Because of the uncapped nature of the IRA tax credits, there's actually no way to know how much taxpayers are eventually going to be on the hook for. Uh, additionally, despite some of the IRA subsidies getting firm end dates, both the production tax credit and the investment tax credit could hang around for decades, as they're set to phase out only after a certain emissions target has been met. Most forecasts don't see that threshold being met until the 2040s or even later. If the prospect of our children and grandchildren paying for these vast subsidies for decades to come isn't bad enough, these subsidies will ultimately be funneled into the hands of Chinese companies. The problem with wind, solar, and batteries is that they require an enormous amount of minerals to build in the first place. For example, a typical electric car requires six times the mineral inputs of a conventional car, mainly due to the battery module. An onshore wind plant requires nine times more mineral resources than a gas-fired plant. Because of this, since 2010, the average amount of minerals needed for a new unit of power generation capacity has increased by 50% as the share of renewables uh, in new investment has been rising. Unlike oil and natural gas, which are found and produced around the world, the production of the main green minerals is quite concentrated. In 2019, for example, the top three extractors of copper and nickel produced more than half of global production alone. And the top three extractors of cobalt, rare earths, and lithium produced 75 to 85% of global production. In contrast, the top three producers of oil and natural gas, which both include the United States, produce less than 50% of total global production. But this mining concentration actually pales in comparison to the, compar the concentration in processing, where China thoroughly dominates. 
China now processes the majority of the world's nickel, cobalt, lithium, graphite, manganese, and rare earths, which are all key inputs for wind turbines, solar panels, and batteries. For several of those categories, such as graphite, manganese, and rare earths, China accounts for 80 to 100 percent of global production. China's dominance goes beyond the processing itself. China also controls the manufacturing and production of lithium ion battery cells, anodes and cathodes, and polysilicon, wafers, crystalline silicon cells, and solar modules. What this means is that green energy is truly made in China. Thus, the vast spending from IRA subsidies will be spent on Chinese products and inputs and enrich Chinese companies. Now, the IRA did include some incentives to try and bring back many of these, input, make many of these inputs domestically, but the process of opening a new mine stretches for many years, if not decades. New processing facilities will unlikely to meet U.S. environmental standards, which frankly is part of why a lot of this production happens in China uh, today. Some final assembly of imported Chinese components will probably happen in the U.S. and often foreign-owned facilities in order to game the IRA, IRA subsidy eligibility, but that facade cannot hide what is really actually happening, which is all a long way of saying that green energy will not be made in the USA anytime soon. To subsidize green energy, energy today is to subsidize China. For decades, the primary goal of American energy policy has been security of supply, to ensure that the United States can rely on itself for energy supplies in the event of a conflict or crisis. Just in the last five years, we have just about achieved that energy security that had been so elusive for so long. The U.S. is a net exporter of oil, natural gas, coal, and refined products, and what oil we still import mostly comes from Canada and Mexico. Yet the avowed goal of the IRA is to throw away that hard-earned security and replace our entire energy system with inferior green alternatives sourced from overseas. To put this in context, at the peak in 2001, the United States relied on the Middle East for 23% of our oil needs. That was viewed as a national security crisis. The U.S. currently imports 74% of our rare earth needs from China, with many other green mineral needs over 50%. There is no prospect of that changing in the near future. Yet we are intentionally seeking to increase reliance on these Chinese energy sources. The security issue goes beyond merely China's control of the inputs of the green energy system. An electric grid is more reliant on intermittent uh, sources is more fragile and expensive. This weaker, more expensive grid is more susceptible to failures, be they weather events, human error, or deliberate damage, because there is not a strong reserve of stable, dispatchable generation. The IRA energy subsidies are pushing the U.S. towards more expensive and less reliable electricity while also discarding an American's energy security in favor of dependence on China. That we get this supposedly in return for a small degree of reduction in carbon dioxide emissions, even though the magnitude of that reduction is questionable once you calculate Chinese uh, manufacturing and the overbuilding of the grid. It might seem incredible to the average voter to believe that we'd be uh, con consciously replacing domestic energy with unreliable, expensive, foreign-controlled energy, but that is the net effect of the subsidies in the IRA. Thank you for the, the opportunity. Thank you, sir. Mr. Yen, you're recognized. Chairman Smith, members of the committee, my name is Dr. Vance Ginn. I'm the president of Ginn Economic Consulting, senior fellow at Americans for Tax Reform, and chief economist at the Pelican Institute for Public Policy. I was also the associate director for economic policy at the Office of Management and Budget um, in 2019 and 2020. And when we're, yesterday was tax day, and we've got a, an issue here where we're looking at taxes, what was in the Inflation Reduction Act, and the massive amount of debt, excessive government spending that's hitting the nation. I think this is a major fiscal crisis that we're looking at an economic threat that's um, very large for the American people across the nation that's driven by excessive spending. But at the same time, we do have a tax problem in this sense. It's usually an ex excessive spending problem, which it is. But now we're seeing how taxes are also influencing the economy um, and taking a pretty big hit overall. We've got about $31 trillion in national debt, which amounts to $95,000 owed per, tax, um, per, per American or $250,000 per taxpayer. The CBO estimates we're going to have an average of $2 trillion a year in, in just in, def, in the deficit annually, um, and, and nearly a $1 trillion pretty soon on the net interest payments on the debt. This is a massive amount of, of an issue, along with rising interest rates. We're also seeing slow economic growth. Last year, when you look at the fourth quarter of 2021 to the fourth quarter of 2022, there was 0.9% growth in the overall economy, was the slowest from Q4 over Q4 on record during a so-called recovery. Um, so I think what we really need to be focused on as well is reining in government spending, passing responsible American budgets that grow no more than the means of the of taxpayers across the country. Um, and I think we'd be in a much better position. And 
that fiscal crisis has been increased dramatically by the so-called Inflation Reduction Act, um, which inflation is still at a multi-decade high of over 5%, still running pretty hot. I think we've still got some uh, increases in inflation that's moving forward as well. So it's something that really needs to be looked at. And so when you're breaking down what's in the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, the CBO's estimate of $391 billion last year, there have been more estimates that have come out that show this is closer to $1.2 trillion dollars more than three times as much as what was initially estimated just last year at a huge cost to the American taxpayer over time, um, along with a lot of the green energy agenda, other things that are a part of this for unreliable sources of energy that are putting money into the situation of picking winners and losers throughout this, this, this overall economy. Um, some of this has been because of, you know, the incentives matter. When you start handing out taxpayer dollars, there will be an increase in EV production, and we, we've seen that. So those estimates have been changed compared to what was done last year. There's also Treasury guidance that has changed some of the dynamics of how much the costs were going to be within um, the Inflation Reduction Act, and also looking at the electric vehicle you know, battery cells and modules and what those costs were going to be. CBO initially estimated those to be $30 billion. And now the estimate, when you look at $45 um, for these batteries per kilowatt hour, are going to be closer to $196 billion, nearly $200 billion, nearly seven times what CBO initially estimated just last year. Um, this, is, this is quite remarkable when you think about it, that the cost of taxpayers of what this is going to do. Um, and there's, there's still a lot more that's, that's going to be done. I mean, even um, Senator Manchin said recently, when he looked at the Treasury's recent guidance, said in a press release, the guidance released by the Department of Treasury completely ignores the intent of the Inflation Reduction Act. Act is a pathetic excuse to spend more taxpayer dollars as quickly as possible and further control, give seeds further control to the Chinese Communist Party in the process. Um, and, and so, as has been mentioned before, this will mean more production in other countries. Um, one of those being in China. So what are the concerns with that? There are a lot, there are a lot of concerns that have been discussed over time. Um, but, but also looking at the defining eligibility, there's still going to be additional eligibility requirements coming out of Treasury. What sort of effects will those have on the estimates that were done? You know, in, in economics, um, trade-offs matter, incentives matter. The amount of money that's being spent of taxpayer dollars continues to matter. And we want more money in the pockets of taxpayers so that way they can put food on the table, um, save for a rainy day and things of that nature. And as we're spending more running up deficits and debt, we're crowding out the productive um, private sector of our economy and we're picking winners and losers in the process. Um, so our hope is that Congress and others will look at re-estimating the high cost of the Inflation Reduction Act um, and in finding ways to start to um, look at what those costs really mean to taxpayers in the process as, as you move forward here in, in this committee and in others. So, you know, given the economic situation that's happening right now, slowing growth, um, slow growth last year, you know, Americans have faced 24 consecutive months of in declining real wages and inflation adjusted wages year over year. This is not a good situation. So, I hope that you'll take a, a relook at the es estimating these Inflation Reduction Act's cost. Thank you for your time. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, sir. Mr. Beachy, you're recognized. Thank you, Chair Smith, Ranking Member Chu, and the distinguished members of the committee. My name is Ben Beachy, and I am the Vice President of Manufacturing and Industrial Policy at the Blue-Green Alliance, which is a national partnership of labor unions and environmental organizations. At the Blue-Green Alliance, it is our belief that we should not have to choose between good jobs, a livable climate, and a fairer economy. The Inflation Reduction Act is the nation's most full-throated embrace to date of this essential truth. Addressing climate change requires us to build a clean economy, and that offers real opportunities to create good jobs for workers and to invest in hard-hit communities. This win-win-win for climate, jobs, and justice is embedded in many of the IRA's more than 100 climate and clean energy programs. I will zoom in on the law's investments in manufacturing. As we build the growing clean energy economy, we face a clear choice. We can continue to hitch our climate goals to vulnerable overseas supply chains that are marred by labor abuses, higher levels of pollution, and shipping bottlenecks. Or we can build our clean energy future on a foundation of good jobs, clean manufacturing, a reliable industrial base, and greater equity. The investments in the Inflation Reduction Act decisively put us on the latter path. 
offering more than $50 billion in landmark investments to revitalize manufacturing for the clean economy. The IRA's clean manufacturing investments alone will create an estimated 900,000 good jobs over the next decade, according to recent economic analysis. The law's total climate investments are expected to create more than 9 million jobs. This offers an unparalleled opportunity for hard-hit workers and communities to reap the economic gains of climate action. Many of the jobs will be in communities in both Republican and Democratic districts that have been hollowed out by decades of divestment and deindustrialization. By creating good manufacturing jobs in the hardest hit, for the hardest hit workers, including black and low income workers, we have the opportunity to counter the racial and economic inequality fed by manufacturing job losses. The opportunity to build the clean economy with union labor, not forced labor overseas. And we're already starting to see the results. As Ranking Member Chu named, within six months of President Biden's signature on the Inflation Reduction Act, companies have announced a wave of solar, battery, and other clean tech manufacturing investments that will create more than 100,000 jobs across 31 states. That, that is faster than anyone predicted. The IRA's onshoring incentives also support our climate goals. Now, much has been said already this morning about the extreme concentration of clean tech manufacturing overseas. That 97% of the wafers used in solar panels are made in China. That China also makes three out of four of the world's electric vehicle batteries. The IRA's historic domestic manufacturing investments are squarely aimed at solving that very problem. The law rightly recognizes that ensuring access to clean energy means making more of the nuts and bolts here at home. The pandemic has taught us much about the dangers of heavy dependency on vulnerable supply chains for essential goods. That is as true for clean energy as it was for N95 masks. Overseas corporations also tend to produce more emissions than U.S. factories in making the aluminum and steel that go into our clean energy goods. Solar, solar panels, for example, are about 85% aluminum, and producing the average ton of aluminum in China causes 65% more climate pollution than in the United States. To meet our climate goals, we need to invest in clean, reliable, domestic supply chains for clean energy. That is what the IRA does. In short, it changes the game. The law finally reverses the untenable status quo. It attaches clean energy expansion to manufacturing job growth while detaching clean energy from vulnerable imports. It marks an overdue return to smart industrial policy by investing in industries that are strategically imperative, not only for climate action, but also a thriving and more just economy. That's a win, win, win. A win for the workers now taking good union jobs, for the hard hit communities seeing investments for the first time in decades, and for all of us who seek a livable climate. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak today. I want to thank you all for your testimony, and we'll now proceed to the question and answer session. And I'll first start with you, Mr. Turner. Um, rural working class communities as taxpayers will be on the hook to pay for these green energy subsidies. Meanwhile, analysis have shown that these special interest tax breaks in the Inflation Reduction Act overwhelmingly flow into the pockets of large financial institutions three times more than any other industry. Large corporations with cells in excess of one billion receive over 90% of all these tax breaks. Companies who make more than one billion dollars receive 90% of the Democrats' green handouts. That's not helping working class families. That's not helping rural communities, that's helping their political buddies. So will rural working class communities benefit from these credits, Mr. Turner? Thank you for the question, Mr. Chairman. Uh, rural Americans bear the brunt of these last couple of years uh, since the pandemic. Uh, a study I found out of Iowa State University talked about how um, rural Americans' cost of living have increased 9.2% their earnings have only increased 2.6%. Rural Americans are paying more than $2,500 uh, 
a year in gasoline than they did a couple of years ago. And that makes sense. Rural Americans have longer commutes to work, to the grocery store, et cetera. Uh, expenses now consume 93% of rural take-home pay. Two years ago, it was 85%. So there is a lot less uh, available cash, uh, just liquid cash for rural Americans to suffer, uh, to, to have at their advantage. Um, I used personal analysis of, of what the Biden administration is offering to rural Americans. Um, I like to think I'm a good ambassador for rural America. I was up at four this morning to do a couple of hours of farm work before I drove here. Uh, so I am from rural America. Um, I use the Virginia Estimator because I live out in rural Virginia for their solar panels. Uh, the average uh, cost for my solar panels for my farm would be around $38,500. Now, with the federal rebate, it would be $26,900. But I still have to come out of pocket $26,900. Um, there's still a problem that doesn't work at nighttime, which is a drawback, I think you could say, to solar panel, because there is a thing called night, and it's not going away anytime soon. So I would need to add another $12,000 worth of batteries on top of that. Um, now, this would save me maybe about $125 a month in my electric bill. But to offset that cost, I need about 18 years. While well, the average lifespan of a solar panel is 20 years, and that's to assume that it doesn't break, it doesn't get hit by hailstorms, which we have in rural America, it doesn't have any roof damage, et cetera. So what are my savings? Uh, and what they say to me as a response is, well, then you should go to the bank and get a loan. And to your point, Mr. Chairman, that financial institutions receive the bulk of this, so they get the tax benefits on the upfront, but then I'm supposed to take out a loan at 9.5% AP to pay for this solar panels. And I could say the same about electric vehicles. Uh, Motor Trend did a, a very good study on, on a famous uh, um, pickup truck that the president drove around in. Not to knock the pickup truck, but the pickup truck was incapable of hauling 8,000 pounds more than 100 miles. I haul 900 pound steers often enough to know that that pickup truck is absolutely useless. Well, that pickup truck is close to $100,000. What's the response? Here's a $7,500 rebate and finance the rest. So it's not made for the farmer in mind. The green uh, subsidies are not made for rural Americans in mind. We are paying with our tax dollars for benefits and subsidies that others, the wealthy, quite frankly, are getting. Thank you. Um, Mr. Horn, the unfortunate truth is that instead of making us more independent for the minerals and components needed in electric vehicles, the structure of the Inflation Reduction Act, credits, and the subsequent regulation have actually supercharged demand in China and made us more reliant on them. Can you shed some light on how the Inflation Reduction Act and the Biden administration's interpretation of the law is emboldening China, increasing the, the Chinese Communist Party's ability to spread its harmful influence? Mr. Chairman, I want to be clear about a few things. I am in no way, shape, or form against technological advancement or energy efficiency or any of these other developments. And I'm not here today to debate or even speak so much on acting and standing U.S. law as I am to try and recommend closing loopholes and solutions that move things forward. I think there is some intent that may have been missed in execution when we talk about some of the recent bills and legislation that's been impacted, and I think that it doesn't take into consideration the nature of some of the adversaries that we're dealing with around the world. When you take the Chinese Communist Party, and I want to take a moment to say Chinese Communist Party, not the Chinese people, but an extension of the government in communist China that looks to exploit and, pred and predatorily take advantage of folks all over the world, you're dealing with a very complex and sophisticated entity. It's one that watches us, that has massive resources, that looks at everything we do and looks for any moment of weakness or access to exploit a loophole so that it can take advantage and use it against us. So while the Inflation Reduction Act is meant to build domestic energy supply chains, to build domestic green energy material sourcing, what it has done in effect without the proper enforcement is allow workarounds for Chinese state subsidized, state owned entities to infiltrate inside our country and to actually work against the very intent of the actual legislation and the IRA itself. So what I would say is that it really comes down to proper enforcement. 
And what we have right now is a situation where with the loopholes, it's actually going to lead to a worsening of the problem if we don't close those. And I would just like to summarize and finalize that by saying that American solutions do exist, and there is an effective lobby out there that tries to dissuade from the fact that they are not that far and not as far from coming online. But they have to be legitimate, they have to be truly American, and they have to be solutions that once they have assistance and time that's initially given from government uh, subsidies and involvement can stand on their own. And those need to be given the true ability to grow and to flourish. Thank you, Mr. Horn. Um, adding on to the loopholes that Mr. Horn just uh, was suggesting, Mr. Stein, both Chinese and American companies, they're getting creative in the ways in which they partner to exploit these taxpayer-funded credits to take advantage of this massive new windfall. As you can see from the headline and the poster right beside me, Ford will build a U.S. battery factory with technology from China. That's in Michigan. Can you walk us through how a foreign company like the Chinese battery maker CATL, which is partnering with Ford on EVs, can gain economic benefits from this green handout regime? Sure. So, uh the IRA has, has many tiers uh, of stackable tax credits that go into all these incentives. Um, and at the foundational level for this battery factory, there is there's a tax credit for manufacturing the batteries here. Um, and that's open to anybody. There's no, there's no domestic uh, input requirements. That's just having the factory physically located in the United States. Now, there's additional requirements if you want to use for, for the EV tax credits that of you know, the national sourcing requirements, what countries they're coming from, that sort of thing. But that's on top of other subsidies. So the, there's already there's an immediate economic benefit from the act, just having the physical factory here, even if it's a, even if it's assembling things that are all coming from China. Uh, in the same sense, uh, because it, they can count as a minority partner, uh, when you start talking about foreign entity of concern issues, uh, if they're a minority partner and Ford is officially the the majority owner, uh, does that qualify as foreign entity of concern? I'd be willing to bet that the Treasury is going to read that as broadly as possible. So, and again, the, 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 when we talk about critical minerals and mining, there's no requirements that those actually come from the United States. Those can be produced by affiliates of the, the Chinese company brought from China or shipped from their mines in Indonesia or, or Congo through China and eventually make it here. So we get a, we like, this is what I mentioned about there's a facade of domestic production of these things, but everything going on in the background, the entire supply chain is still controlled by the China, Chinese companies and ultimately the Chinese government. The Chinese government is populating off of our green tax credits from the Inflation Reduction Act. Mr. Jin, the Inflation Reduction Act is at the heart of the tax credits we are talking about today. That bill was sold to the American public as a plan to do just that, bring down inflation by reducing our deficit. You recently penned a report looking at the cost of the Inflation Reduction Act and specifically um, these tax subsidies. The projected costs to the American taxpayers have skyrocketed. To what do you attribute this increase and how high could these costs go? Mr. Chairman, you're right. This, we recently looked at some of the data that's coming out, the latest information that wouldn't have been available last year when CBO was doing their estimates on um, the number of EV vehicles that are being produced. I mean, if you give tax breaks, incentives matter, right? So you start to do more production along those lines compared with others. Um, also, some of the new Treasury guidance that has come out along the lines of what was in the Inflation Reduction Act, um, a combination of those things has contributed to an increasing cost of those EV tax credits for battery cells and modules. Um, CBO initially estimated it to be $30.6 billion last year. Um, there's a range of estimates now, but if you look at the $45 tax credit that goes for these electric vehicle batteries, um, the higher end, along with the increasing number of them, there's that would be $196.5 billion, which is a 540% increase compared to, or a higher amount compared to what CBO estimated just last year. 
And that's given some assumptions. And so it could be even higher than that, depending on how many vehicles or batteries are being produced, how many vehicles are sold, things of that nature. And, and again, as been mentioned earlier, a lot of this is going to upper income folks, big businesses, and that sort of thing. Um, at the same time, not doing much to reduce inflationary pressures in the economy. Thank you. I now recognize the acting ranking member, Ms. Chu, for any questions. Mr. Beachy. The IRA includes entirely new requirements in the tax code for domestic content, which incentivizes companies to onshore manufacturing of clean energy technology, like solar panels, wind turbines, and electric vehicle batteries, just to name a few. How will this help the U.S. economy? Thank you. I, I appreciate the question. Uh, the first way it will help the U.S. economy is good jobs. You know, decades of bad policy uh, saw the outsourcing of factories as good for efficiency. You know, that logic was dead wrong. Workers lost a primary source of high-paying union jobs. Communities lost tax revenue. And our nation lost the industrial base that is the backbone of most modern economies. Now, I mentioned that the law's manufacturing investments alone are projected to, to create at least 900,000 good jobs over the next decade. Job quality matters just as much as job quantity, of course. And it's important to note that manufacturing jobs tend to pay better, have better benefits, and better access to unions than, than on average, particularly for workers without a four-year degree. The second way that this would support our economy is these investments could help us to build a more equitable economy, uh, specifically by redressing the economic and racial inequality that has been fed by manufacturing job losses. Uh, you know, manufacturing job losses were actually concentrated um, among uh, low-income communities and communities of color, particularly among black workers. If we grow clean manufacturing in a targeted manner, it can help to reverse these trends as part of a broader strategy uh, to build a more just economy. The third thing I'll name is uh, energy security. You know, we need more reliable supply chains for energy security, which is a critical component of economic security. Uh, I mentioned that you know, the, the pandemic has taught us much here, and uh, the need to have a local supply of essential goods is just as true for clean energy as it was for N95 masks. In short, you know, we should not expose our clean energy future to shipping bottlenecks and geopolitical conflicts. And, uh, you know, that, those are three ways, essentially, that the IRA's manufacturing investments alone could support a stronger and fairer economy. Mr. Beachy, you um, mentioned that this will help uh, those economies uh, in communities that um, are low income and communities of color. Um, these environmental justice communities are more prone to flooding, extreme heat, and air pollution. And it's our responsibility to ensure that they experience the economic benefits of the clean energy transition. Can you expand on the ways that the IRAs IRA is supporting communities impacted by environmental, economic, and racial injustice. Yes, thank you. Um, I want to first make clear that uh, we do not speak on behalf of any environmental justice groups. Uh, they speak for themselves. But we have been happy to support their leadership in this domain. Uh, you know, the, the Biden administration created the Justice 40 initiative to help dismantle the structural racism in our society and ensure that investments such as those from the IRA go to the most hard hit communities. Um, that includes disadvantaged communities, and which is a broad category. It includes communities that have been enduring disproportionate air and water pollution and environmental injustice, communities that have been uh, enduring disproportionate risks uh, from flooding and storms and droughts, as you named, uh, communities that have been experiencing economic insecurity, uh, low income, uh, higher unemployment, due to deindustrialization and divestment. Uh, and, of course, structural racism that is interwoven through each of these uh, burdens. The application of Justice 40 to the investments in the Inflation Reduction Act uh, is sometimes it ex has explicit uh, set-asides for disadvantaged communities. And in other cases, we see the Biden administration putting forth guidance showing that the projects will be prioritized to the extent that they invest in these hard-hit communities. And can you also say a few words about the IRA's requirements for prevailing wages and apprenticeships, um, how will these increased wages strengthen the clean energy transition? Yeah, uh, it's critical to pair uh, these investments in our clean energy future with high road jobs. 
Uh, clean energy is clearly the energy of the future. We want to make sure that the jobs uh, in clean energy are also the jobs of the future. That requires that they be prevailing wage, uh, prevailing wage standards be met, as well as apprenticeship programs. To get the full value of the tax credit, solar and wind developers simply have to pay their workers well. And they have to ensure pathways to long-standing careers that are, can sustain families. That's for the first time in our history, we are tying clean energy to high quality job standards. Thank you, I yield back. I now recognize Mr. Buchanan from Florida. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Critical uh, hearing. Uh, and I want to thank all our witnesses. Uh, everybody wants to take a different tack. I want to focus a little bit on the spending because we've got the debt ceiling and what's really taking place here. Well, we've got an estimate of $275 billion, and it ends up they're claiming Wall Street Journal and others are complaining it could be $1.3 trillion. Uh, you look at the last 20 years, frankly, um, we've, we, our taxes, basically spending's gone up $20 trillion in 20 years, so there's plenty of blame to go wrong. But I'm, talk about being competitive. It also, your balance sheet, we're getting weaker and weaker as a nation. I'd like to, Mr. Jen, what's your thoughts, uh, just, just in terms of the fact of we get an estimate that it's a trillion over, and as a business guy for a lot of years, it seems like you need to cap it. If you want to do 250 or 300, pick a number, you cap it. When the money runs out, it runs out. But in this case, it runs on, and it could run on 1.3, 2 trillion, but it's going to add to the deficit and make us a weaker nation. Thank you, Mr. Buchanan. Mr. Buchanan um, you're correct, Congressman. This is a massive amount of spending that's been going on for a number of years now. Um, if you look at the last 20 years, the national debt has increased by uh, $18.5 trillion. And if we had just matched something like population growth plus inflation, a sort of a spending limit type of rule that even Colorado and many other states have, um, the increase in the debt would only have been $500 billion. So it would have been an $18 trillion swing in the direction that's positive for taxpayers in the process, because this debt matters. This debt's got to be paid back at some point. We're paying higher and higher interest on that debt as the overnight lending rate between banks um, set by the Federal Reserve is at 5% could continue to go up given inflation is also elevated. And so I think that these things are going to continue to have a larger and larger cost. And it's something like the Inflation Reduction Act, around $300 billion can go up to $1.2 trillion in such a short period of time. We need to have a better Mr. handle of that. Me, real quick. Yes, sir. This year, interest is going to be on the debt $400 trillion. Ten years, $1.2 trillion. It'll be bigger than our budget for national defense. Yes, sir. Mr. Horn, let me ask you, in terms of looking at trade, uh, it seems like we're not, we're not even on the field. We're not in the stand. I, I've been to Africa multiple times. You see the Chinese are very active and engaged, building roads and bridges and, of course, doing all the mining and other things that they're doing. What's your sense in terms of where we're at from a trade standpoint, and are we competing at all with the Chinese and other uh, countries? But I look at primarily the Chinese and what they're doing with a billion people in Africa. That's a great point, Congressman. We are not in the game and we need to get in the game. The reality is that the Chinese, the Russians, other countries are making great strides forward by taking advantage of these massive resources throughout the globe. The United States used to be the leader in this space. This was an area that we dominated and led the world in until we started offshoring it in the 1990s and we've continued to do that since. We have the capability to lead the world again in this space, not only by developing resources abroad, but by processing them and exporting them from our own shores as well, too. Yeah, let me just mention, I, I'm confident we have the companies and the capacity and the and potential leadership, but we've got to get in the game. And we're not in the game. We're not on the field. And I'm very concerned about that. Nobody wants to spend any more money, but that's probably a pretty good investment. We've got a lot of people that are on the ground, but we've got to make sure we're committed to trade and competing. And I, I think if we compete, we can be competitive, but we're not. Mr. Sign, what's your thought in terms of the trade aspect, uh, in terms of where we're at compared to the Chinese and others, in terms of what's going on in trade? Well, part of what the Chinese have done is, is a very deliberate policy, and it's driven by state uh, state-backed organizations and um, state-backed banks 
and they have given out loans and they have bought mines, they have built processing facilities. Even countries that have tried to, like Indonesia, tried to Im increase the amount of nickel processing that actually goes on domestically in order to improve their own trade balance. Well, Chinese companies have come in and built a bunch of processing facilities that they own, and then that product is then shipped onto China to be used. So they, this is a very active and conscious uh, state-driven policy all over the world to get access to these minerals, to control their processing, and it's, it's very much a forward-looking, uh, centrally planned uh, system. So, and it's something that, we, you know, as a free market, more free market country in the United States, we don't think that way. Our, uh, you know, individual companies might be long-term planning, um, but this is part of why this is, it's dangerous to increase reliance on some yeah, of these I, Let me just close and just control. say that I know we can compete with a lot of countries, Japan, China, everybody else, but we got to get back on the playing field in an aggressive way. And uh, we've got a lot of capacity, a lot of great people, but we don't have the leadership for whatever reason in this area, this space. Thank you, and I yield back. Gentleman from California, Mr. Thompson is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to the witnesses for being here today. You know, Mr. Chairman, I really seriously thank you uh, for calling today's hearing. It's not every day that the minority gets such a generous opportunity to talk about all the good work that we've done. I'd like to start by making a simple point of comparison. In the last Congress, Democrats on this committee advanced legislation, the Green Act, which ultimately served as the climate portion of the Inflation Reduction Act. It was the biggest investment in fighting climate change in our country's history. That bill was specifically drafted to incentivize the use of domestically manufactured goods. It includes very clear incentives for companies to use steel, iron, and other manufactured products sourced from right here in the United States. It includes very clear requirements that to access these tax credits, companies must pay good wages. Credits for solar energy, wind energy, geothermal energy, for fuel cells, for hydropower. To maximize any of these credits, companies have to use domestically produced materials and pay domestic workers a good wage. On the other hand, the last time the Republicans were in charge, their sole legislative accomplishment was the 2017 Republican Tax Act slash giveaway. It did not diminish at all, uh, distinguish at all between the U.S. and Chinese businesses. In fact, according to JCT, foreign investors, including the Chinese Sovereign Wealth Fund, got a $345 billion tax cut. And on top of that, because my Republican colleagues are completely unwilling to pay the debts they racked up when they slashed taxes for the very, very rich and for corporations, the majority's first markup of this Congress was a debt prioritization bill that prioritized wait for this, the Chinese bondholders. So just to recap, Democrats' signature bill invests in clean energy, directly boosts domestic manufacturing and energy production, moves us away from fossil, fuel, fossil fuels, and creates jobs here at home, while paying down $300 billion of our debt. The Republican signature bill in 2017 was fully available to Chinese companies and investors added over $2 trillion to the debt, and primarily benefited very rich people and big corporations. And your first bill of this Congress prioritized Chinese debtors over America's seniors. The contrast is pretty clear to me, and I appreciate the chance to lay that out for the American people. Mr. Beachy, in your opening statement, you said Americans shouldn't have to chart, shouldn't have to choose between good jobs and a livable climate and a fair economy. I agree with you 100 percent. Could you please talk a little more about how the incentives in the Inflation Reduction Act will create good-paying jobs for American workers? Absolutely. Thank you for the question. So uh, I just mentioned that when it comes to clean energy deployment, uh, the bill explicitly uh, makes ties the expansion of clean energy deployment to high road labor standards for the first time in U.S. history. You know, for, for, for far too long, we've seen a discrepancy in the quality of jobs between the clean energy sector and the traditional energy sectors. 
This bill, this law, the IRA, aims to close that gap. Uh, again, if wind and solar developers, uh, it would, makes good business sense for them to take advantage of the higher tax credit uh, by ensuring there's a prevailing wage for workers and high road uh, apprenticeship programs to ensure a pathway to sustainable careers. In addition, for the manufacturing sector, uh, $50 billion being invested in our in manufacturing to really turn the tide of deindustrialization that we've seen in recent decades. Uh, again, manufacturing jobs tend to offer higher wages, better benefits, and increased access to unions. Uh, so this is really an about face uh, for uh, two decades of policy um, that have ignored and left many workers behind. Thank you very much. I, I just want to add, uh, Mr. Turner, I, I read some of the things that you've posted online talking about how there's no cri uh, climate crisis, it's all, it's all communism. You know, just this week, I've met with two oil companies, two major ag interests, uh, one of which was grape growers from, from my area, and the shellfish growers, all of whom told me of deep concerns they have with climate change and everything that they're doing to having to deal with that. I don't think any of these people are communists, and I think some, saying something like this is pretty outrageous. I yield back. Uh, thank you, Mr. Thompson. For the record, I want to clarify a statement that you made. The very first piece of legislation that passed out of this committee was the protecting taxpayers and victims of unemployment fraud. Um, with that, Mr. Smith is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Certainly thank you to our witnesses for your engagement here today. I think it's important uh, that we hear uh, from all of you, uh, even with uh, mixed viewpoints. I think uh, that that can be very healthy. I certainly appreciated the emphasis, uh, Mr. Ginn, of your testimony on the ways the Biden administration has exponentially grown the cost of the Inflation Act by ignoring, straight up ignoring, both the plain language of the bill as well as the intent of its authors. I don't agree much uh, with much of what uh, is in the IRA, the so-called IRA. Uh, there, there's nothing uh, new there for anyone. Uh, but I do want to point out, out, however, that Senator Manchin has been extremely clear about his intent in, in negotiating the critical mineral requirements for the so-called clean vehicle credit. That bill says critical minerals must be sourced in the U.S. or from a trade agreement partner or recycled in North America. I appreciate that a number of my Democrat colleagues on this dais have expressed similar concerns about the Biden administration's efforts to undermine that. Trade agreements are negotiated using trade promotion authority, and they are enacted through legislation passed by Congress and signed by the President. These critical mineral agreements fail to meet the standard while giving away their largest benefit, access to U.S. tax credits, while accruing no new benefits for American manufacturers or consumers. I'd say workers are hurt in that process as well. Every time the Biden administration takes administrative action, like expanding the scope of these tax credits through critical mineral agreements, it increases the cost of that legislation. To state the obvious, that increased spending does not reduce inflation. In fact, it increases it. Mr. Ginn, you covered some of my concerns about the Biden administration's expansive view of trade agreements in your testimony. I appreciate that. The size of the economies, let me say, uh, that the administration is negotiating with in these critical minerals uh, agreements, for example, the UK, EU, and Japan, have a combined GDP of more than $25 trillion, far outweighing the size of the economies of the countries we actually currently have comprehensive, true comprehensive trade agreements with. Those 20 countries have a combined GDP of just on, under $10 billion. From those numbers alone, I would assume the cost of the credits flowing out to other countries would vastly increase. Mr. Ginn, can you, can you speak to that? Thank you, Congressman. And I think you're right. Part of this is going to other countries, especially with the new rules that are being put out, and going to countries that don't need these sort of benefits. Um, I think this is something that we should ultimately be looking at. If it's really an Inflation Reduction Act, You've got to look at reducing the debt, <laughs> reducing how much we're spending at the end of the day, um, because otherwise this just increases the debt, crowds out the private sector, is inflated away, and it reduces our purchasing power in the process. And at the same time that we're benefiting you know, other countries and things of that nature, that is a huge trade-off for the American people as a whole. And I think it's another downside of the Inflation Reduction Act. Okay, thank you. I, 
Um, I have concerns that even though I think there were probably some good intentions uh, with, with the legislation that was passed last year, of course I certainly maintain my objection, uh, but some of those good intentions as they're applied to, as we heard over 100 programs, intentionally going against what market forces there might be or market-based dynamics, whether it's wages, you know, input costs, or even the output uh, impacts, um, um, I, just, I just have concerns that uh, there can be great intentions, but as has happened all too often around this place, actual results are sometimes opposite to what the intentions were. Uh, that, that is uh, the foundation of my concerns, and, and I hope that we can have the discussions we need to have to address the fact that fiscally, this legislation is getting away from us. And, and I would hope uh, that there's either an explanation of how we can rein that in with a strategy to do so, uh, or certainly uh, I, I would hope some acknowledgement that at least we need to have the conversations uh, to, to do something legislatively uh, to take a stronger, more fiscally responsible position. Thank you, I yield back. Mr. Larson is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I uh, want to associate myself with the remarks of uh, uh, Mr. Thompson and uh, also start by uh, asking Mr. Beachy and thanking you and uh, all of our witnesses for your testimony. But Mr. Beachy, are you a card-carrying member of the Communist Party or is the Blue-Green Alliance uh, aligned with the Communist Party? Is the Sierra Club, uh, are they aligned to your knowledge with the Communist Party? I appreciate the question, sir, no. Well, uh, thank you for that. And uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Beachy, uh, Mr. Thompson was talking about a couple of points, but the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, what is your estimate in terms of uh, the jobs that the Inflation Reduction Act will create? Uh, so it's not our estimate. We actually commissioned uh, proper economic analysis um, uh, from the Political Economy Research Institute at the University of Massachusetts. Well, well uh, let me ask you before you go any further. Are they a communist organization? Uh, thank you for clarifying. They are not. Um, their analysis uh, shows that uh, over the next decade, uh, the climate and clean energy investments in this law would uh, create over 9 million good jobs. Um, and that is across sectors. I mentioned the 900,000 for manufacturing. Um, there's actually uh, about 5 million jobs that we created in clean energy, thanks to the rapid expansion of clean energy deployment fueled by this bill. There's <clears throat> jobs to retrofit buildings to make them more energy efficient and healthier for residents. Uh, there's jobs to restore and protect our lands and build the resilience of our communities. Uh, there's jobs in agriculture uh, for rural communities. Um, the, the, the expanse of this bill reflects the fact that we have to uh, restructure the economy to meet the challenges of climate, jobs, and justice. And in so doing, we're creating over 9 million good jobs. Thank you, Mr. Beachy. And, and let me say that I think that the, China does represent a threat and one that should be taken seriously. And uh, that hopefully, uh, in a bipartisan fashion, that we can focus on this. I appreciated uh, Mr. Horn's comments in terms of focusing on the industries of the future that we need to be investing in and investing in it so that we regain our position uh, that we have lost over decades. That will require Americans pulling together uh, and making sure that we're making the kind of investments that uh, will create 12 million new jobs and have unemployment at its current lowest level in 50 years. More needs to be done, especially uh, on the investment side in the industries of the future. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back my time. Mr. Schweikert is recognized. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'm, I'm going to direct this one to Mr. Stein just because um, for some of us, there's, there's more than just the, the scale of industrial policy 
and the arrogance of Washington thinking we understand what the next technological breakthrough is, because you know we're all so brilliant up here. Um, but Mr. Stein, um, I, I live in the desert. I live outside Phoenix. Um, we actually have an excess of power every afternoon. So our actually power rates crash to almost zero because we produce excess photovoltaic, particularly in their summer months. But then this, this thing called the sun goes down and we're still running our air conditioners. So a project we're working on, and it's bipartisan you know, with my delegation, is we have all these lakes up and through this really rugged mountain territory just outside Phoenix, and we're gonna pump water up when power is basically free, up on top of the cliff, and then run it back down so water is a battery. But the way the Orwellian named Inflation Reduction Act um, uh, definitions in, what is it, um, 42X and, is it 40 also, 48? Um, does my hydro battery actually count as a battery under their definitions? Well, not, not for, the, for the battery tax credit in particular. It's, the, 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 it's chemical batteries that, are, uh, that count as... So, so it's battery. not the elegance of what is storage and green, it was almost the elegance of, hey, we're going to give money to our favorite friends in industry. Right, it's, um, it's subsetting an industry. Yeah. So, so back to um, just another thing that's just driven me crazy is um, our brothers and sisters on the left promised us, hey, here's what these things are going to cost. And I'd be willing to work with them saying, okay, can we hold everyone to our commitments? But we all see the information coming out, and yes, I couldn't do this without boards. So let's take a look. The cost estimates on the battery production credits, um, when this piece of legislation was moved, um, our brothers and sisters on the left told us it would be $30.6 billion. That, that's what CBO, that's what we were told. We're now seeing estimates that it has as high as $196.5 billion dollars. Would you be willing to take it back to what you told us it would be, what we told the American people it would be? So let's actually take a look at wind. Cost estimate on wind was going to be $11.2 billion. Now we're actually seeing that the scoring of the actual language, not what we were told, not what the American people were told, but what is now 64, excuse me, 68.4 billion. And Look, um, whether you want to do Credit Suisse, which actually I'm not sure I would use, considering they're pretty much gone now, um, but Goldman actually came back and said, hey, it's not like $280 billion of handouts to big green corporations. It may be $1.2 trillion. Okay. Are you willing to actually put it back to the, at least cap it at that 280, which you told the American people and told us? Or do we actually say, well, Goldman's saying that the actual language when scored out is 1.2 trillion. Do I have anyone on the panel who has an expertise on explaining what happened here? Why are we now seeing four times the um, exposure to the American taxpayers? But can you imagine the dis distortive effects? And, and the last bit of my rambling is I know most of us probably showed up at our basic economics class. We've seen the numbers of how many Americans intend to buy electric vehicles. We're now going to give these huge subsidies, mostly to the very wealthy, and it's not actually changing, really, the number of people who intend to buy electric vehicles. We chose to subsidize something people were already going to do. We didn't, like, say, put in definition saying, hey, we're going to focus on the research for iron air batteries, which could be done with all domestic, no foreign, you know, isn't this be nice if you're actually concerned about a domestic product? Um, instead, we produced massive subsidies for very wealthy people for something they were already going to do. It's just the absurdity of what we're dealing with. So thank you for tolerating me, Mr. Chairman, but I feel better getting that off my chest. Thank you. Mr. Blumenauer, here is recognized. And it's important. We want you to feel better. You know, some of us uh, were of a generation. In fact, this show is still being shown around the country 
um, where uh, Rocky and Bullwinkle, there was a feature that had Mr. Peabody and his boy Sherman, and they had a Wayback Machine. And I'm listening to the chairman uh, describe what's wrong with what we did, and I'm having a moment where I feel like I'm in that Wayback Machine. Because what the chairman said attacking it was almost exactly what some of us were saying six years ago for the Republican tax bill. Only it was more generous to foreign companies, and the American people got less back. And it was concentrated at those who needed it the least. I'm concerned about being trapped in the Wayback Machine. Uh, I started the week being concerned for the speaker, who was before the New York Stock Exchange, sort of describing how we're going to dodge the bullet on dealing with the debt ceiling. And the poor guy could not explain what the Republican proposal is, because what he had to commit to be elected speaker was various things that don't pencil out. And so we're kind of lurching towards a potential crisis here. We're ignoring some of the very tangible results that have taken place during the Biden administration. We are currently in a situation where our, uh, the recent uh, inflation for the producer inflation is 2.7 percent, the lowest that it's been in more than two years. The consumer price index increases have been the lowest since May 2021 at 5 percent. Gas prices have dropped 17.4 percent since the spike that was occasioned by the invasion of Russia into Ukraine. We have record labor participation. And some of my most conservative concerns, uh, friends are concerned about who's not working anymore. Labor participation is at its highest level in years. And in terms of the unemployment, it's the lowest that it's been in 40 years. And black unemployment is now the lowest that it's been in history. Uh, I don't think the Biden economic proposals and management is a train wreck. Instead, it is very clear that this is working. It's not done yet. There are things that we want to do, things that we put in place in the transition to a green economy, creating millions of jobs, some of which we are seeing in a number of the constituencies of my Republican friends. This is working. And I don't think any amount of going back into the Wayback Machine, uh, ignoring, well, actually, that wasn't fair, because uh, the Republican bill actually uh, included provisions that would have dramatically scaled back wind energy investment in their original bill and had to be embarrassed by the committee to taking it out so that it really didn't wreck the proposals that we had going forward. I hope that we can move forward. I think it was you, Mr. Horn, that said something about responsible budgeting. I'm all in favor of it. I hope that we will get an actual proposal from what the Republicans are going to do with their budget, what they're going to cut, how they reconcile it, and match it with the President and what we will do, and have an honest conversation instead of appearing in press statements, smoke and mirrors, and going back in the way back machine. I don't think that gets us anywhere, and the American people deserve better. I, I appreciate your tolerance for uh, my walk down memory lane. It was quite jarring as we started the committee. Uh, I, I, as To quote Mr. Schweikert, I feel better getting that off my chest. Uh, and, and you can use my speech anytime. Thank you very much, and I yield back. We always want everyone to feel better in our committee. So thank you, Mr. Blumenauer. Mission um, accomplished. It's good. Um, according to a new analysis from the Coalition for a Prosperous America, I'd like to submit to the record, the Chinese Communist Party is likely to receive a windfall of $125 billion from these credits, which is more than half of what China plans to spend on their military this year. Mr. Winstrup is recognized. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for being here today. You know, one of the things we hear about today is the crisis, the uh, climate crisis. And there is a crisis, especially if you've been a victim of a drought or a fire or hurricane. They all kill people. They all destroy lives. But science is real. Something to consider, you know, we use sunblock. Why? To prevent skin cancer from overexposure to the sun. Yet at the same time, we need vitamin D. It's very important to our health both situations. And you know, I might be able to prescribe for someone uh, a medication that would kill the virus or bacteria that's within you, but if it kills you too, it doesn't do much good. I um, would, will want to submit to the record an article here from the NOAA, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration that's entitled, Study, Reducing Human-Caused Air Pollution in North America and Europe Brings Surprise Result. More hurricanes. Very scientific article from a federal agency. The point I'm trying to make is you can overprescribe sometime, and we need to be careful about that. And if we overprescribe to the point of killing people, it's a problem, and we need to take this very seriously. Look, I have solar panels, and I'm, I'm on the grid. Drive a hybrid. All of these things. I'm for all of the above. I'm all for new technology. I'm all for clean air, clean water. But science is real. And Mr. Beachy, you said win, win, win. It's not always a win, and this is clear evidence of that. If you look at what this says, what it says is, where there has been too much decretion, uh, d diminished pollution, there's more hurricanes and more storms. Why? Because there's no longer a screen between the sun and the earth, warms the oceans, kicks it up, does the same thing over the land. So you can overprescribe and do more damage than good. It's the point I'm trying to make. And let me just you know, quote some things from this article. This is from 1980 to 2020. So without significant amounts of particulate pollution to reflect sunlight, the ocean absorbs more heat and warms faster. The decrease in pollution has led to a warming, global warming, right? Have we done it to ourselves? As I said, I'm all for clean air, clean water, healthy people, especially as a physician. We have to take these types of things into consideration. It's creating more hurricanes and more storms. Here's a quote in the article. The ironic results suggest the necessity of careful policy decision making, which is what we do here. The ironic results suggest the necessity of careful policy decision making in the future that considers the pros and cons of the, the multiple impacts. We have to do that. So don't make this a religion, make it a science. And let's do what's right. Don't make it a political point, make it a scientific point. So Mr. Beachy, it's not a win-win-win. It's not. And the proof is here. The facts don't lie. And I suggest we be more careful. And maybe as a body here, we can work together scientifically to do things that are better for America. But my other grave concern in all of this is our dependence on an adversary. In so many ways, our supply chains, our energy, everything else, we're going in the wrong direction. And I, and I want to reiterate the national security risk that that brings. Mr. Horn, I know your military background. Thank you very much. Could you maybe relate to this committee some of your concerns about the national security risk that we take with some of these policies that are being promoted? I think we have to be realistic about the world that we live in. And when we look at state actors, adversaries across the world, they don't necessarily have our best interests in mind. There's been a number of articles that have come out just this week about the possibility of the People's Republic of China cutting off supply of a lot of these key materials, which are needed not only for electrification and energy transfer, but defense critical uses as well. We cannot afford to rely on them 
for our own capability to defend ourselves from them and others. And we end up feeding their military through our acquisitions. With that, I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Pascrell is recognized. Uh, I think this chairman, Mr. Chairman, that this hearing is a farce. Let me start off very mildly. Republicans can't honestly attack the Inflation Reduction Act, so they're resorting to outright projection. The Inflation Reduction Act is the single largest investment. That's a critical word. When we spend money, the people's money, that is a qualifier. It must be an investment, not just for the moment, but for the future. That's what investments are all about, whether you're in business or whether you are in government. So we're talking about manufacturing. We're talking about good union jobs, clean energy and innovation. Read the law, what it says. Doc, Democrats uh, passed historic bills last Congress protecting American industry and blocking benefits to Chinese communist companies. Look, last month we were socialists, this month we're, we're communists. And I take exception to what you say and what you write. What do you think, you're gonna scare us? What are we gonna be next month? What is that hate speech going to bring? How is it instigate violence in this country? Communists, you write, were the Greens at first. Really? I'm not a communist. I'm not a socialist. But that's what you said, sir. I respect your professionalism, but I don't respect any of your ideas that insult anybody on this side of the aisle, be it that side or this side. So, Republicans overwhelmingly opposed our agenda uh, and certainly are no other, you know, no Mother Teresa on the Chinese Communist Party. Republicans left domestic protections out of the 2017 tax bill. Nowhere to be found in that bill. And we're still discovering what was in that bill. I guess we didn't read it at first. The corporate tax breaks and the offshore provisions were a boom to China. Read the bill. In 2018, Donald Trump vowed to protect a Chinese communications company from going bust after the party approved trademarks for a member of his family. In 2019, Donald Trump sold out on Hong Kong. Last week, the leader of the Republican Party called the Chinese communist dictator the top of the line and a brilliant man. I never heard him say anything like that about somebody in this country, except that meets his ideological standards. So who in God's name you think you're kidding? Where is the outrage? All we hear is silence on those things. The sad irony is the Democratic manufacturing agenda has benefited Republicans' own constituents. The Financial Times found that over 75% of the $204 billion in semiconductor and clear energy, clean energy projects pledged since the Inflation Reduction Act, CHIPS Act, have gone to GOP districts. Stop them. You don't want them? You didn't vote for them, but I bet you took a picture when I got some money to expand the business. How many of you took pictures with the infrastructure that voted no? Look, the gig is up. Certainly don't listen to me. Listen to the, the polling that's been going on after everything you put before us and the people of this country. Republican districts. That's over 58,000 jobs for their communities. So we sh you should be celebrating. Look at those districts that got 
plenty of benefits. But every Republican in Congress voted against the jobs boom from the Inflation Reduction Act. Every one of them. Want to take on China? Let's do it. But we need genuine action, not another nonsensical hearing. And with that, I yield back reluctantly, and I can assure you, I have a lot more to say about what <laughs> you've written and said. I hope I get that opportunity, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, may I respond again? to some of these comments, please? Go ahead. Um, because I know they are all directed at me. At no point did I call anyone on this committee or any no, member of Congress a communist. And I resent the fact that it's being implicated that I did. What I was talking about by saying the green agenda is communist in nature is this. We, I do not applaud this government, this administration, this Congress, it's sending your government. our jobs. Just as our, much as it is mine. Let the gentleman My respond government? to your accusations. I'm sorry? Go ahead. Mr. I do Kerner. not applaud as sending American jobs overseas in the name of a green agenda. Um, America used to be the second largest coal producer in the world. We are now fifth. Why? Because we have closed more than half of our coal jobs. World coal supply is going up. So what are we saying? We are saying we need more coal, but it's not going to come from America. I stood with Navajo elders in northwest New Mexico who looked at me and said, in one of the most difficult conversations I've ever had, because we were fighting to keep that coal mine open, and he looked at me and said, this is what you white people do to us all the time. You sent us to this reservation. It wasn't our land, but you put us here. But we found coal, and with that coal, we built the entire southwest. And now the green energy has come, and now you tell us no more coal, and you plunge us back into poverty. I have stood with mayors Chairman in small Regular towns Order. of West Virginia where they look at their entire city that has Chairman been, their Regular entire Order. small town that has de been decimated. This gentleman has the floor. When any witness is ever attacked by one of these colleagues, I think that he needs that opportunity. So go ahead, Mr. Mr. Chairman, excuse Thank you, me, Mr. but Chairman. I believe Mr. Pascrell said that his comments were not directed at any one person on the panel in particular. That's not how I saw it, Mr. Well, Turner. that's your opinion, but Mr. Pascrell... You're not recognized, Ms. Sanchez. Mr. Turner, please uh, finish. Mr. Chairman, okay, I think Mr. Chairman, thank you for running such a democratic process here in our democratic government. You're not recognized, government. Ms. Sanchez. Respond, Mr. Chairman? I, I, have, I have stood in small towns in West Virginia that used to be thriving, that had communities with, with little leagues and, and schools that were, that were well-funded that are all closed because we have sent their jobs overseas. There are billionaires who fund green groups in this country that invest in foreign coal, and they will tell you that they will be damned if a man in West Virginia works on a coal mine, but a nine-year-old girl in Malaysia or Indonesia or China, they have absolutely no problem with. And so when I call the green movement communist in its nature, maybe that is being too gentle of a term. What it is doing to rural America, oil jobs, coal jobs, fracking jobs, no one is asking them how they are paying for gas, how they are paying for 30% prices in food, 15% prices in consumer goods. They are absolutely and categorically denied. And, and I respect the gentleman at the end of this table who's saying the jobs that will come, that will come. But the fact of the matter is the futurable is very different than the actual. Right now, rural American and rural American energy workers are struggling tremendously and they are being ignored. Thank you, Mr. Turner. Chairman, Mr. I Ferguson, you're recognized. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Turner. If I could just simply say amen to you. I'm from a district that saw the devastation of a job market following NAFTA. We were home to the largest part of the textile industry prior to NAFTA. And because of decisions in D.C., we lost a generation of workers and we plunged more people into poverty because the insensitive nature of decisions that are made in Washington, D.C. Now we're doing it to more rural communities that, are, that, that, that have been producing the energy that America needs. Your comments are spot on. Mr. Chairman, if I could submit for the record an article from the National Review where John Kerry simply suggests, and it's reported, that oil workers laid off due to Biden policy should go make solar panels. So ordered. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, that shows the insensitivity of people that are making these policy decisions. Where, what, what, these people have grown up in, in these communities. They have built their lives there. They built their families there. And now you're simply saying uproot and go move somewhere else.
the devastation in our rural communities. We have way too many people on this dais that don't care about rural America because there aren't enough voters there to get them reelected, and they are completely out of touch with so many of the problems that we're facing. Washington, D.C. has done a hell of a job of turning rural America into an inner city. The two groups of people in this country that share the most in common all too often are rural America and the folks in the inner city. Lack of economic opportunity, failing education, high drug use, high crime, and failing infrastructure. It is painful to watch our fellow Americans go through this. And while they are gutting our communities for policies like this, that are promise of jobs that I promise you will never come back to this reservation that you, that you described. It's taken a generation and a half to get those jobs back in our district. And we've done it. And we've overcome Washington, D.C. in the great state of Georgia in the third district. But all the time that they're gutting our communities, 90% of these, of these tax credits are going to the wealthiest corporations and to the wealthiest Americans. 90% of them going to companies that have over a billion dollars in profit. So while my colleagues on the other side of the aisle talk about how important it is that corporate America pay its fair share, and they say it over here, they then turn around and give them the largest tax break that basically drives down to zero, their tax rate. What in the heck are they talking about? Oh, we want them to pay, but we're going to give them a huge tax break and a huge subsidy. This is lunacy. And by the way, now we've under, you know, parent, joint tax apparently underscored this thing so badly that now we're, we're talking about over a trillion dollars. So they want to raise taxes on one hand, and then they want to, to, to almost a trillion dollars in new taxes. Then they want to go ahead and give somebody a trillion dollar tax break. The hypocrisy is stunning, if not nauseating. So I look at this and think to myself, why are we doing this? Why are we funding the Chinese Communist Party? The, chi the, 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 the private investment firm CALT that's involved in automotive technology policy, the Chinese company. These tax credits through, through licensing could actually go th to the Chinese Communist Party. This, these folks mean to do us harm and they mean to take down America. We have a bipartisan committee looking at competitiveness with China. Why in the world would we send one dollar, one dollar of U.S. taxpayer dollars to the Chinese Communist Party? It makes absolutely no sense. So when I look at these things and I look at what they're doing, it, 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 it's, it's just mind-boggling to me. We say that we want to fight China, yet we're going to fund China. We say that we want to help rural America, yet we gut rural America. We want major corporations to pay their fair share, and yet we're going to give them almost over a trillion dollars in green energy tax credit to lower their tax liability. How else are you going to pay for all this other stuff if you're doing that? This makes no sense. I, I just wish that my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, many of them, would understand the lives that they, are ruin, that, that they will ruin in rural America and in rural districts like mine. It is hard to watch. And Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Mr. Davis is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, too, want to thank all of our witnesses. You know, my district is seriously impacted by structural racism. It contains many low-income communities. <coughs> and certainly it has people of color. It also suffers from economic divestment, a lack of manufacturing opportunities, when it used to be a manufacturing mecca, almost anything that you could think of was being developed in that area. Mr. Beecher, could you discuss 
how impactful the Inflation Reduction Act can be on dealing with communities like the ones that I serve. Absolutely. I appreciate the question, sir. <clears throat> when we talk about the loss of manufacturing jobs, sometimes there is a, a caricature that is presented, uh, uh, painting a picture as if it was only white workers who, who lost their jobs and suffered the economic impacts. Black workers were disproportionately impacted by the deindustrialization of the United States. Since the 1990s, black manufacturing workers have lost 30%, there's been a 30% drop in black manufacturing employment. That's according to the Economic Policy Institute. The IRA aims to start turning the tide by reinvesting in the, in the communities that have been the hardest hit. It does this by, for the first time, channeling billions of the people's money into high paying, good manufacturing jobs. And as mentioned, this is not just theory. It is, it is, it is actually, the evidence is already being seen. With the, in the first six months, enough announcements of clean technology manufacturing to create 100,000 jobs. Many in the heartland. The, the critical uh, premise of the IRA is that we do not have to choose between good jobs, economic, racial, and environmental equity, and a livable climate. And it does this by choosing sectors of the economy that are strategically imperative for advancing each of these goals and fueling them. It is a welcome return of industrial policy that has been used in this country since the time of Alexander Hamilton. And by leveraging that policy now, workers like those in your district, communities like those in your district, stand to gain from the benefits of higher wages, cleaner air, fewer climate-related impacts. In short, more jobs, a livable climate, and a more just economy. Let me just ask in comparison to the characterization of spending, would one call this spending, or would they more appropriately call it investment? It's absolutely investment because there's a return on this investment. And that return is money in the pockets of manufacturing workers across this country that have, been that have seen their jobs go away. It's a return in the form of investments in communities that have seen their own uh, economic base deindustrialized. I actually uh, was born in the heart of West Virginia, in the middle of coal country. And for too long, folks in this town have talked about energy transition and investing in hard-hit workers and communities. The IRA moves from words to action. There will not be fairness for workers that have been impacted by energy transition and communities that have been impacted by energy transition unless it is a deliberate policy choice. The IRA, for the first time, invests real money in the communities like the one I was born into. There's a $10 billion a pocket of money to spur more clean technology manufacturing. Four billion of that is explicitly set aside for communities facing energy transition. Thank this you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Mr. H Mr. LaHood is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I want to thank our witnesses today for your valuable testimony here today. Um, the Inflation Reduction Act, I think, is a great example for us here in Congress of why regular order is so important. Backroom deals, legislative text thrown together at the last minute, and a lack of proper discussion and deliberation leads to all sorts of unintended consequences. Even Senator Manchin has seen the effects of this kind of legislating as he got more of what he wanted out of it than anyone. One particular area of concern that I have and want to highlight, uh, as some of my colleagues have already touched on, is the lack of safeguards that were put in place to prevent these tax incentives from being enjoyed by our adversaries. Well, what do I mean by that? In addition to serving on the Ways and Means Committee, I also serve on the Intelligence Committee and the newly formed Select Committee on China, which is a bipartisan committee that we're uh, addressing the malign activities of the CCP. 
As a part of that work on Intel and the Select Committee on China, we learn every day about the growing threats from China. And the Inflation, Inflation Reduction Act demonstrates how easy it is for us to literally let them in through the front door. Before I get to my questions, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to ask for unanimous consent to enter into the record this Fox News article dated February 20th, 2023, entitled, CCP-backed tech companies are poised to cash in on Biden's climate bill, uh, national security experts warn, unquote. Without objection. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Horn, uh, you were actually quoted in this article, so I'll begin with you as I direct my questions. Um, can you talk about the China 2025 initiative and how aspects of the IRA play right into CCP's efforts to gain advantage uh, over the United States as it relates to our allies? Absolutely, and thank you for the question. I think before I answer just briefly, I want to state a couple of things that I think everyone in this country hopefully can agree upon, which is that the Chinese Communist Party and the Russian Federation engage in practices that are not only bad, in my opinion, for their own people, uh, but are dangerous to partner with, certainly for the United States or any of our allies. And so when we look at what the CCP is doing, I, I think that it should serve as a threat to all of our interests everywhere. They have been relatively overt in terms of what their plans are for expansion and suppression of US and other potential competitive interests around the globe and as they expand. What they have also telegraphed that we have failed to properly acknowledge and react to is that they're planning to use our own actions against us. They're planning to use our government funding, our universities, our infrastructure, anything that's exploitable against us in any means possible. So when we look at aspirations of technological development, I don't think there's anyone out there that would disagree that we want to see technological development, economic growth, commercial development, and economic activity. But we have to be careful as we look at driving catalysts to drive U.S. industry and U.S. innovation that we don't open ourselves to a Trojan horse to come in and work against us. Because the CCP is an expert at doing this. They know exactly how to exploit what we do. They've been doing it for decades. And their plan is to suppress us and prevent us from being a competitor to their world domination. I say again, their world domination is their goal. And if we look at how they're exploiting and mistreating their own people, they wish to do that to the entire world. And if we allow loopholes without the proper oversight and enforcement, we enable them to do so. Uh, thank you for that, Mr. Horn. I think one of my frustrations with the IRA has the, the federal government putting their thumbs on the scale as it relates to certain industries and, and subsidizing those. Um, just to follow up on that, when, when, um, can you share on how these types of incentives that are made part of the IRA actually prevent U.S. alternatives and competing companies from growing and thriving domestically? I'll give an example to try and put it into context. So in the, the rare earth industry, there are, unbeknownst to a lot of people, several U.S. alternatives that are actually not as far from coming online as people would realize. However, they stand a threat to the global hegemony and monopoly that the Chinese Communist Party has on the industry. And they will do everything possible to prevent those options from coming online, from price uh, fluctuation, flooding the market, everything measurable. So when the resources that are designed to go to U.S. companies to allow them to compete on a fair stage with the, with the Chinese Communist Party are diverted. It allows the Chinese Communist Party not only to take those funds, but to suppress any possible legitimate competition for a better service provided. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. General, uh, Ron, <laughs> Mr. Estes is recognized. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for our, uh, our panelists for being here today. I know we've talked a lot about uh, good tax policies, and I just wanted to, uh, to highlight, you know, when the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was passed in 2017, that was a good tax policy because it actually ended up in more jobs for, for minorities and people of color than had, had been in the previous decades. So it was so important to help get the economy growing, and, and it didn't pick and choose jobs for some people and then doing away with jobs in other industries. And, and so uh, that's, that's why it's so important as we talk about issues like that in, in our hearing. One of the great misnomers of, the, of last year's so-called Inflation Reduction Act, um, in fact, even C-SPAN titled the bill, 
taxes, health care, and climate change on the screen when we were voting on the bill. It didn't reduce taxes, but it was full of special interest Green New Deal provisions that are billions of dollars more expensive than initially proposed. The official CBO score for the so-called Inflation Reduction Act's energy and climate provisions was $391 billion over the 2022 to 2031 time period. However, because the EV tax credits are uncapped, that estimate is drastically low. An estimate by Credit Suisse is that double the estimate at $800 billion, and Goldman Sachs has provided an even grimmer outlook uh, at, at $1.2 trillion. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to submit for the record an article from the Wall Street Journal titled, The Real Cost of the Inflation Reduction Act Subsidies, $1.2 trillion. Without objection. Thank you. Part of why the EV tax credits in the IRA would be so much more expensive than CBO projected or predicted is because the Biden administration has been working overtime to expand which foreign countries are eligible for the credit. Republicans and Democrats on this committee were recently told by the administration that they've entered into a new trade deal with Japan under the guise of critical minerals agreement, which conveniently allows Japan to qualify for EV tax credits paid for by the American taxpayers. The Biden administration has been working overtime to expand eligibility for the EV tax credit for foreign countries, all without the approval of Congress. Mr. Stein, uh, do you have any knowledge of the Biden administration working with third-party groups on ways to get around congressional intent regarding eligibility rules for the EV tax credits contained in the IRA? Well, that's actually a big problem. Um, the way Treasury has been making these decisions uh, and the IRS has been making these decisions has been behind closed doors. Um, it's not clear who is lobbying them on these things. Certainly there's big companies that are lobbying, but who they're all meeting with, that is not that is not public information. We actually have, have been foying uh, Treasury to find, try and find out who is taking these meetings, but uh, right now we don't really know. So we, we've also seen the Biden administration attack American energy production under the guise of climate conservation. I can tell you that the Kansans I represent are really the ones who care about conservation. The farmers, ranchers, and energy producers who work the land are caring for our natural resources. Instead, the Bi President Biden and my colleagues on the left have done everything they can to end hydrocarbons, decimating American energy production and relying on dirtier fuel from foreign adversaries. The result has been higher costs for Americans. And that's even when President Biden admits that we'll be continuing to use hydrocarbons for years to come into the future. Just last week, the EPA announced their new admission standards, which will force Americans into more expensive vehicles that are simply impractical for families it, rural Kansans and Americans who aren't in areas with access to EV charging stations or that have to drive long periods of time. In the same time, adding these new EVs will put a greater strain on our energy grid, weakening American energy production and strengthening the world's largest battery producer, China. Mr. Stein, can, can you help my colleagues understand the detrimental impact of strengthening China by forcing Americans to buy electric vehicles? So we've seen example. We've already seen examples just in California. Uh, uh, I think last year when they were having uh, wildfire and electricity shortage issues, and they said people don't charge your electric vehicles in order to protect the grid. So the problem is, is that if you are having problems with the electricity grid and you all, your cars also run on the electricity grid, then you don't you don't have that redundancy that you have if you if you can get in your car and get away from the the wildfire, for instance. And so it ultimately the the. Making a greener grid, it becomes more fragile to begin with. That's the problem that California is already facing. Texas is facing the same problem. But then you increase the load on the grid, too, by adding all, trying to add all your transportation onto the grid. It's only compounding that weakness that you've created. Yeah, that's why it's so important to have a strong base load, uh, even to support the sustainable energy that we produce. So thank you all, and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Ms. Sanchez is recognized. Yeah, I'm just, um, wow. I've heard a lot of talk from my colleagues today about standing up to China, and I will just say that talk is cheap. But making general, generational investments to reshore good paying jobs and create supply chains within the United States, in making those investments, that's not cheap. And rebuilding our infrastructure and modernizing our energy systems to keep our economy competitive with China, that's not cheap either. Um, but when my colleagues on the other side of the aisle talk tough on China, Sadly, their talk is cheap. 
Most of them were here to spend more than $2 trillion on a tax windfall that overwhelmingly benefited the wealthiest in this country and multinational corporations. And the Republican tax scam didn't do one single thing, not nothing, to prevent foreign individuals and businesses from reaping the benefits of that windfall. Um, Mr. Beachy, it hasn't been a, even a year since we passed the Inflation Reduction Act, but there are clear differences in the results of the IRA and the 2017 tax scam. Um, can you tell us just briefly what are some of the results that we've seen from the IRA so far? Happy to. So I mentioned at, at the top um, that in the first six months of the, since President Biden signed the IRA, we saw companies announce clean technology manufacturing investments uh, that total about $90 billion. Um, and those investments uh, will take place in 31 states and they will create about 100,000 jobs. That's due, uh, according to a report by Climate Power. Um, so we, we're, we're already seeing early investments because of the IRA. Um, and aren't those investments designed to pay dividends over time for American workers as well? Indeed they are. Can you uh, talk a little bit just briefly about how the prevailing wage and apprenticeship, domestic content and assembly requirements across the IRA's credits work together to pre create good paying union jobs here in the United States and keep them here? And can you also answer whether these kinds of jobs that they are creating would be available for workers who are transitioning out of traditional energy sectors? Yeah, appreciate the question. On, uh, so first is develop the actual deployment of solar and wind power. Um, you know, the IRA invests a historic amount to deploy more clean energy to meet our climate goals. But for the first time, critically, it pairs those investments with the high road labor standards of prevailing wage and apprenticeship programs to ensure that clean energy workers can enjoy family sustaining jobs. In the same time, the IRA includes, like, as you noticed, as you mentioned, the domestic content bonus, which creates a demand pool paired with all the supply push investments for clean domestic manufacturing of the nuts and bolts of clean energy. Everything from EV batteries to solar panels and, and uh, all their component parts, wind and all its component parts. That is a durable uh, investment because those jobs will be a, around for a long time. Smart industrial policy means investing in the technology of the future and that's what we're doing. I appreciate that because we, we, we don't use gas lamps to light our homes anymore. We use energy efficient light bulbs and, and we must progress. So traditional energy sectors may have job losses, but there are jobs that are being created and it's not crazy to think that perhaps they can transition into some of the new jobs that are being created. I'm, I mentioned that uh, the, the policy takes seriously that uh, the fairness for workers and communities impacted by technology shifts won't just happen organically. It has to be a deliberate policy choice. I mentioned the $4 billion investment for clean manufacturing in, in coal communities. In addition, there is a, a bonus credit um, to encourage solar and wind developers to invest in hard hit uh, energy transition communities across the country. Uh, there's an additional program that will have $250 billion in loan authority to, to retool existing energy infrastructure for new purposes, providing an opportunity for economic development in some of the hardest hit regions in the country by the energy transition. I appreciate that. Mr. Stein, I just want to uh, make you aware that in the IRA, hybrid cars also count. And so hybrid cars which run on gasoline can also be a cheaper alternative for families that can't afford purely electric cars. Um, Mr. Ginn, uh, I just want to be clear that the 2017 Republican tax scam bill cut taxes across the board to a rate lower than anybody was even asking for, with no restrictions to prevent foreign corporations from getting a tax cut. Did the 2017 tax scam bill do anything at least to make sure that those foreign corporations spent their tax windfall on building U.S. manufacturing facilities with good paying jobs? I'm not sure about that specific provision, uh, but I do know that there were trillions of dollars that were sent back, repatriated from other countries back no, to the United States. No, the question along with was whether growth. or not the bill did anything to make sure that foreign companies who got this big tax windfall had to reinvest that in building U.S. manufacturing facilities with good paying union jobs. I wasn't, I wasn't not a part of those discussions, and so I'm not advised. I will take that as a no, and I yield back my time. 
Thank you. Um, for my colleagues on the other side of the aisle who continue to disregard the Tax Cut and Jobs Act and what it did for hardworking Americans, today, under the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, a family of four who make $64,000 or less will pay zero in federal taxes. And in a congressional district with that median household of $50,000 a year that I represent, that is a substantial tax cut for working class, hard working class families. And that's the fact, and that needs to be in the record. Mr. Smucker, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for holding today's hearing. Uh, it really is important that we revisit the true cost of the uh, Inflation Act. And I know many of my colleagues have raised the new $1.2 trillion price tag of the tax credits in the Inflation Act. But I also want to draw attention to another area that was just mentioned uh, about the true cost of these credits. The inflation, uh, the IRA is chock full of requirements to utilize unionized labor, prevailing wage mandates, and union apprenticeship ratios. And I would never uh, I respect uh, labor unions and the uh, choice that workers have to participate in a labor union. But in my district and, and across the country as well, about 90 percent uh, of our workers have chosen not to be part of a labor union. Uh, and in that regard, this policy is discriminatory against most of the workers in my district, in addition to uh, increasing costs when we limit uh, competition only to uh, union companies. I want to also uh, mention uh, two things uh, that were brought up in the hearing. One was uh, labor force participation rate. I think Mr. Blumenauer uh, brought this up. Uh, and he mentioned that we are at record highs. And I'd like to submit for the record, Mr. Chairman, uh, a chart uh, posted by the St. Louis Fed, if I can do so. So ordered. Uh, this chart shows that just prior to the pandemic, February 2020, uh, labor participation rate was at 63.3 percent. And the latest, uh, March 2023, it was 62.6%. But so still not uh, at pre-pandemic uh, participation rates. Very important. Uh, and, but it shows that Democrat policies have failed uh, to have uh, uh, workers return to the workforce uh, in the numbers they were prior uh, to COVID. That has a lot of different um, uh, policy uh, impacts. Uh, and uh, one additional thing, uh, Social Security was, uh, was uh, mentioned, and uh, Democrats are fond of uh, saying that uh, Republicans are taking actions that uh, uh, would hurt the beneficiaries of Social Security. And I want to remind uh, people listening that um, the Biden administration recognizes that within nine years, the trust fund will be insolvent, which would result uh, in uh, individuals relying on Social Security getting about 80 percent of their total benefits that, that are owed to them. Uh, and they have chosen in their budget to not ad uh, in, uh, address that in any way. No policy proposals that would, that would uh, fix Social Security to ensure that we can keep uh, the promises that were made uh, to people relying on Social Security. Uh, talked a lot. Mr. Turner, I appreciate some of uh, your comments. You talked about the impact of the policies uh, on rural Americans. Uh, certainly, I'm seeing the impact of rising gas prices um, uh, on people all across my district. I've had individuals uh, talk to me at, saying they have to, had to make tough decisions about buying food or gasoline. Uh, and uh, interestingly, President Biden has characterized our rising gas prices as an incredible transition, uh, is what he called it. Interior Secretary Deb Howland refused to say gas prices were too high when prices had surpassed $6 per gallon in some parts of the U.S. Uh, it really appears that uh, driving prices higher on traditional energy may be uh, intentional on the part of those who want to see us move to renewable energy uh, faster than what the market would allow for. 
Do you think that's true? Do you think this is intentional, that uh, this administration wants to see higher gas prices that are hurting American people? Yeah, Congressman, thank you for the question. Uh, absolutely, it's intentional, because fossil fuels are very, very popular in America. And even if people may use them as a pejorative, Americans love the fossil fuel economy that it has created. They love the convenience. They love the comfort. It is the reason why millions of people, legally and illegally, are trying to get into this country, because fossil fuels have made us an incredible country. To make fossil fuels unpopular. I'm going to stop you, have you to because make them I'm, I'm running out of time. Thank you. Um, I, I think the case can be made this is intentional on the part of the administration to see higher gas prices and the impact of the American people is devastating. Mr. Jin, you talked about uh, industrial policy, uh, government picking winners and losers, and, and we certainly see that in the IRA. Talk a little more about the impacts of that. How does that affect you? You talked about the importance of economic growth. I could not agree more, but how does industrial policy impact economic growth? Uh, it simply crowds out other more productive purposes that were chosen by the marketplace compared with government planning or, or the use of taxpayer dollars for propping up specific industries or businesses overall, but in there, that should be done based on profitability, not based on the taxpayer's dime. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Hearn is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing today. My main concern is that the Democrats don't understand the monster they have created. Goldman Sachs' new $1.2 trillion score of this bill should scare every single American, regardless of party. I fear that there has been an over-subsidization of a market that is not capable of producing the intended result. I know it is hard for some in Congress to wrap their heads around $1.2 trillion, but that kind of subsidization involves massive global input to produce the needed output and it is concerning the Democrats didn't understand what would have happened when you unleashed this type of impact on the marketplace. To think that the Chinese Communist Party would not benefit from this poorly formed policy is both naive and foolish, especially in the highly integrated global marketplace that we see today. I see a lot of talking about both sides of our mouth from the administration and my Democrat colleagues. My Democrat colleagues say that they want to drive energy costs down and look for cleaner solutions. Guess what? I do too. But to spend $1.2 trillion in taxpayer money to fund green energy while also attacking the oil and natural gas industry will only drive energy costs up. The unintended consequences of these actions will have cons that far outweigh the pros. Driving investment out of less expensive, reliable, traditional energy into expensive, Renewables will further drive up costs, creating energy poverty across this great nation. Time and time again, this administration has put the cart before the horse on extreme policy without thinking about the unintended consequences. It will be a tough road ahead, and I beg the question, how will my Democrat colleagues explain to their voters why energy prices go up dram drastically in the next decade due to poor decision making here in this committee? Ronald Reagan once said, if you want more of something, subsidize it. If you want less of something, tax it. We do not know what the true American consumption of renewable energy is. An unprecedented $1.2 trillion in subsidies for renewable energy both, is both reckless and wasteful. This administration, with the help of Congress, has created an apocalyptic market distortion in our energy markets that will have a devastating effect on the American people who rely on less expensive traditional energy. Mr. Jen, I, like every Republican that I know, is an all the above energy supply uh, individual and representative here in Congress. I believe that there is a place in the market for renewables to compete on a level playing field with the traditional energy sources. That being said, can you tell us what the unintended consequences of the IRA are in respect to the unprecedented subsidization of green energy and what the means of the economics of the energy, energy, energy industry are and the provisions in the IRA inflationary. Yes, sir. Thank you for the question. Um, and you're right. You're putting your thumb on the scale more towards uh, renewable, unreliable sources of energy over a longer period of time. And there should be a level playing field for all energy sources um, to whatever is going to be profitable. That means it's best for the American people in, in the process as well. And so this sort of industrial policy does not allow for there to be more economic growth, prosperity. And, and there's a lot of talk today about, well, there'll be a transition. The transitions are best 
based on market forces, not based on government direction and mandates. That's, that's taken straight out of what communist countries like China do, not what America should do based on free market cap capitalism that is the best, pa best path to let people prosper. We need to get back on that path, and this is what the Inflation Reduction Act leads us more towards direction of the economy instead of letting markets work. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Stein, what do these massive subsidies mean for our energy costs and our grid security as these hand-picked winners in the IRA are untested as reliable sources? Well, that's a key, is reliability. Ultimately, uh, unreliable sources increase costs to the electricity grid as a whole. And that's, the, that's a key that wind and solar look very cheap at the specific turbine, because when the wind blows, it's very cheap. But grid-wide, you have to pay more for transmission. You have to build extra wind turbines for backup. You have to build gas plants for backup. There's, the overall cost to the grid increases electricity costs. And you see that around the world. You see that in California. You've seen that in Germany, in Denmark, in parts of Australia. Higher uh, renewables penetrations means higher. Mr. Stein, if I may, I, and thank you for so much for your response. But I'm going to give a great example of that. The largest, uh, we think of Google being a green company, a company, their largest or near largest data server farm in the world since 25 miles to the east of Tulsa, Oklahoma, a thousand yards from a gas-fired slash coal-fired energy production facility. And when asked why they're there, they need reliable energy, reliable energy. So for all the talk that my colleagues across the aisle are talking about, this is not reliable energy. The fossil fuel industry has always provided that and will continue to do so. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Mr. Higgins is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the United States, according to a study out of Brown University, spent $6.2 trillion in three Middle East wars in the past 20 years. The Middle East is made up of 17 countries. It has a population of about 480 million people, all in. And if you were to take oil, off the table, the entirety of the Middle East has an economy equal to Finland. We lost 7,000 American soldiers in wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, again, because of our addiction to oil. So the oil age won't end because we run out of oil. The oil age will end when we find a better more efficient way to power everything, including automobiles. A way to power them that is quicker, quieter, and eventually cheaper. There's been a lot of talk here about jobs in the economy. Well, let's talk about jobs in the economy. Fortune Magazine, January 11, 2001, quote, Trump to leave office with the worst jobs record since Herbert Hoover. The number of employed Americans fell by 3 million during the Trump time in office, including the loss of 300,000 manufacturing jobs. Don't lecture me on job creation, particularly in the manufacturing industry. Fortune magazine. Bloomberg Analytics, February 23rd, 2023. Biden administration, 12 million jobs created in 14 months. To quote them, Biden is on track to be the greatest jobs producing president in the history of the country. 12 million jobs in 14 months, including 800,000 new manufacturing jobs. Unemployment, 3.4%, the lowest unemployment rate in 54 years. Inflation forecasted, it is high now, at over 5%, at 2.5% at this time next year, consistent with historical trends as it relates to inflation. The Inflation Reduction Act, probably misnamed, but it did provide incentives, not only for American manufacturers, but also American citizens to bring the cost of electric vehicles to parity with gas-powered vehicles. This is beginning to turn a trend that we're 15 years late in addressing. You know, 
China, we need to be tough on China. They cheat on their currency. They steal our intellectual property. They treat their people poorly. They treat their environment poorly. But we need to be tougher on ourselves about China. All of the rare earth minerals that go into manufacturing batteries, most of them are in Africa. China spent a trillion dollars in infrastructure investment not to help the people of Africa, but to allow them to exploit the continent of Africa so that they could control all of the rare earth minerals. China now refines 68% of the world's nickel, 40% of the copper, 59% of lithium, 74% of cobalt. So the Inflation Reduction Act is an effort to encourage domestic manufacturing of electric vehicles. And we have a long way to go. It is not solving the problem right away, but it represents a beginning. Mr. Beachy, you have talked about the Inflation Reduction Act in terms of jobs, in terms of economic development, but also could you talk briefly on the efforts to make electric vehicles more affordable for Americans, but also incentivizing domestic manufacturing of those electric vehicles? Absolutely. Thank you for the question. <clears throat> so there are historic tax credits available for the manufacture of electric vehicles and uh, making those vehicles more affordable at the same time. It's critical to pair those two goals together, swift deployment and good manufacturing jobs making the component parts. The $7,500 uh, tax credit will make uh, electric vehicles more affordable, and the used tax credit will make them $4,000 uh, cheaper uh, for your average family. Uh, meanwhile, though, it invests, those tax credits are built to make sure that those component parts are made here. And that is critical for jobs, but it's also critical for, for our clean energy goals and our climate goals. You know, when one country produces <clears throat> the vast majority of the supply of a critical energy good in the world, we should treat it as the same way we treat a corporate monopoly. We should not pin our climate goals on hope that the world's monopoly producers maintain prices low forever. The IRA responds to that problem by investing in the clean manufacturing of the technologies of the future here, including electric vehicles, solar panels, uh, wind turbines, et cetera. Uh, that is as good for our jobs goals as it is for our climate goals. Ms. Miller's recognized. Thank you, Chairman Smith, and thank you all for being here today. Last year, Republicans were united in warning the Democrats that their out-of-control spending was going to come back to bite the American people. And that's certainly the case with the spending that's gone on, the so-called Inflation Reduction Act, which has ballooned in cost, empowered the Biden administration to ignore Congress, and most of all, it supercharges the inflation crisis that the American people were already bearing. The bill was portrayed as a promise to help our struggling economy, but as soon as it was forced through Congress in the backroom deals, the truth came out. Instead of a bill to help the middle class Americans, the IRA is welfare for billionaire dollar businesses, handouts to well-connected Democrat donors, and tax breaks for luxuries for the upper class to enjoy. My constituents in West Virginia will pay the price for liberal elitists to feel self-righteous for buying an electric vehicle that contains parts made with child and slave labor and is sourced directly from the Chinese Communist Party. Everyday Americans will also pay the price through higher electricity prices because the IRA increased the already perverse incentives to produce less power for more expensive means. When we have such abundant natural resources, we must ask why radical liberals are picking winners and losers in the process, trying to text us back into the dark ages. Mr. Turner, I represent the major energy producing state of West Virginia. We're the second largest producer of coal in the United States and an important producer of natural gas and oil. I want to thank you for your comments because our coal communities applaud you for standing up for them in Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. tends to denigrate those people as insignificant. I know what bad policies from Washington, D.C. do. I have a, a 
county in my state, in my district, that's gone from 100,000 people down to 14. We understand bad policy is bad policy. The Inflation Reduction Act creates incentives for unreliable electricity sources, namely wind and solar. While renewables can play an important role powering the grid, they fail to provide affordable baseload power that is essential for our families, our businesses, and our emergency services. Most wind and solar products are not made in the United States, while our traditional energy is sourced from states like mine. What will the impact be on rural communities if these credits are not repealed? Thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, these, these jobs will continue to move overseas. Like I said earlier, we are still producing more coal than ever before. Estimates for coal production and coal consumption, excuse me, are continuing to go higher. But America's share of that pie is just getting smaller. West Virginia's share of that pie is getting smaller. These tax credits will go to companies that just produce coal in, in India, in China, in, in Malaysia. So my question is, if we still need coal, and we're admitting we need coal, solar panels are made with coal. All these wind turbines are made with coal. EVs require coal. So if we need coal, why can it not be American coal? Why is it green to send the coal jobs to a foreign country and, and then plunge communities like the great communities in, in West Virginia, plunge them into poverty, claiming that we're somehow protecting the environment? It makes no sense. Not only are West Virginia's environmental standards far superior than anything you would see in Southeast Asia, but the jobs and the tax revenue stay in your community as well. You're exactly right. Thank you so much. Mr. Horn, before President Biden's Treasury Department announced the rules regarding the electric vehicle tax credit, which clearly ignores the intent of Congress, I led a letter with several of my Ways and Means colleagues warning the Treasury of major concerns with Ford's partnership with China's largest battery manufacturer, CATL. I'd like to submit that letter for the record. So ordered. Can you detail the national security risks of these types of partnerships with CCP companies, as well as the broader risks that come from continuing the U.S. reliance on China for our EV batteries and critical minerals? Congresswoman, I cannot overstate the complexity and the ability to work around us that the Chinese Communist Party has. They will continue to exploit every loophole. So when they see an opportunity to use a Trojan horse approach to get a Chinese state-subsidized company in, partnered with an American company, it is nothing short of an infection by a foreign body. Thank you. I yield back. Mr. Murphy is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, gosh, I think in every committee on this uh, Capitol Hill, we're talking about China, China, China. We're at war with China. Let's just call it that way. They're trying to destroy our way of life. They have balloons. They're viruses. They're, they're everything. They're stealing our intellectual capital, everything. Let me, let me, let me try to be uh, nonpartisan here and point out three points that I think everybody would agree with on my Democratic colleagues. Maybe they'll look at the film. Uh, number one is clean environment. We all want that, right? Okay. Number two, where everybody's against slave labor. We talk about it horribly in our country 150 years ago. It's, it, should, it shouldn't happen. Number three, we want to cut CO2 emissions, correct? We can all agree on those things. But let's actually dive down on those. Clean environment. Why would my Democratic colleagues want to promote the destruction of the earth in mining policies in countries that it is much dirtier, absolutely poorer for the environment rather than the U.S.? Perplexed beyond my, beyond my understanding. Two, slave labor. In the pursuit of the moral authority or, or the moral high ground of saying, I feel better about my, uh, my EV, we're having we are promoting child labor in the Congo. But it's okay, we're just not gonna talk about that. And then third, CO2 emissions. So we wanna pretend we're doing great for the world with our EV vehicles when China, to feed our appetite, for energy, uh, clean energy, is now growing two coal plants a week. A week. And we're exporting that to them. So we're making our small little uh, uh, incremental change here, and we're blowing it out on the other side of the world. So in actuality, it doesn't mean a damn thing. So let me offer, offer a suggestion. Oliver Stone, you know that Hollywood guy, he and I are just buddies. Um, 
He and I agree on something, clean energy. It's called nuclear power. That satisfies every single thing here. We're not giving jobs to China. We're not throwing money to China. We're not in using slave labor. It gives us a clean environment and no CO2 emissions. So why don't we gather around that? So I know that's a little bit off topic. It helps with the environmentalist. It stops funding communist China. And um, I actually have a, a question for Mr. Becky. Um, you said the Sierra Club was not happy with the CCP, correct? I said they are not a communist, that's correct. Okay, would they be happy? Are they happy with the fact that China is now producing two coal plants a week to feed our appetite for clean uh, energy? No, they absolutely would not, and that's why they support global engagement uh, so as to reduce emissions across the world. Okay, I, I mean, I just think it's, we're, we're, we're blinding ourselves, we're, we're not understanding, one, that China wants to take over the world, and we're feeding them for it, and by the way, they don't give a damn about climate. They're not doing anything about climate because they're pushing, pushing, pushing coal. Anyway, I just don't get it, guys. Come on, wake up, and let's get to the table. Um, the United States is literally giving our competitive advantage away to China as they race to cheat American companies. Um, Mr. Uh, I'm sorry here, I'm just a little, I just can't believe sometimes, y'all wake up. Mr. Horn, you served under the former President Trump during a time when U.S. became the global energy superpower. Can you describe how our energy security and energy affordability have changed since this President Biden took office? Well, Congressman, I want to say that I think there's been attempts by both presidents to try and combat communist Chinese policy and the CCP. I think a lot of it comes down to what we're talking about in this hearing, which is moving beyond intent to actual execution and impact of policy. The problem that we have currently with looking at some of the loopholes in the Inflation Reduction Act is that it basically plays to the Chinese Communist Party's ability to, to work our own policy against us and Absolutely. exploit loopholes, to uh, quote what you said about them wanting to, to take over the world, that's absolutely their priority, and they've clearly stated it. And we have given them a variety of tools for them to do that with federal support if we don't look to close those loopholes and to close those workarounds. Absolutely. And I would say just one final piece on this. The ultimate tragedy here is that there are a plethora of American opportunities and American projects that can actually move the ball forward on, on this front, on other energy fronts as well. You referenced nuclear. Uh, that's a separate subject, but there's obviously massive amounts of American opportunity in the mineral space there as well. All we have to do is unleash our own capabilities, and the market will correct this itself. A absolutely, and I think we can do it in America cleaner, absolutely cleaner, we're not feeding our world's greatest adversary, and we're creating our own American jobs. It's not that hard. We just have to wake up and understand that we have somebody, a country on the other side of the world that wants to see our demise, and we are feeding them with our own pursuit of clean energy when we could be doing it at home. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. Ms. Sewell is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As we create, as we work to create a more equitable economy emerging from the pandemic, we must look to addressing climate change within our tax jurisdiction and the impact it will have on all communities across America. Use of the tax code to allow for the expansion of Section 45Q is just one example of sound bipartisan policy that will allow for future large scale carbon capture and sequestration projects to develop over the next decade. I'm proud that my bill, Carbon Capture and Sequestration Expansion Act, was incorporated last year into the Inflation Reduction Act, but there is still much work to be done. It is no secret that air quality measurements over the last three decades show that low-income communities of color face some of the worst pollution rates. This has been proven through science. And ignoring such facts will continue to lead to an array of life-shortening health outcomes for many in my communities. It is for this reason that I am serving as the Democratic lead sponsor on the Carbon Capture and Utilization Parity Act this Congress. Working with Congressman Schweikert, our bill works to establish parity between 
45Q carbon capture tax credits for sequestration while at the same time uh, support using carbon, using captured carbon in the creation of products to reduce emissions. In other words, we can make communities healthier and simultaneously establish good paying jobs. Earlier this year, Climate Power released a study which compiled investment announcements made by the private sector companies along with the anticipated job creation such investments would make. And it showed that lots and lots of jobs will be created. In my home state of Alabama alone, projections show $1.3 billion worth of outside investment coming to the state, resulting in over 1,200 new jobs. These manufacturing investments serve as a great starting point in addressing racial inequality related to income in Alabama. But like our tax code, there's still much work to be done. Last Congress, I had the distinct uh, honor and privilege of being co-chair of the Ways and Means Racial Equity Initiative. Our two years of work further highlighted why many in, in the African American community have known for years, and that is that the loss of manufacturing jobs in the United States has disproportionately affected people of color. My question is to you, Mr. Beecher. Um, with my remaining time, can you further elaborate on the research that you and your colleagues have conducted at Blue Green Alliance on how U.S. investments within the, I, the IRA have the ability to create a new workforce uh, in places like Alabama and in communities like the ones I serve? Happy to. <clears throat> so I, I've already mentioned that there's over $50 billion of investments in clean manufacturing in this bill, which is truly historic. Um, offering an opportunity to rebuild solid manufacturing jobs and our nation's industrial base at the same time, uh, while better equipping us to have more reliable supply chains for clean technology needs. Um, it is also true uh, that a lot of the investments in, the, in the, uh, the IRA are dedicated to reducing the kinds of emissions you spoke to. Uh, industrial emissions, I'll, I'll just name. There is this new $6 billion program created at the Department of Energy to slash industrial emissions from steel, cement, and aluminum facilities while making these facilities more competitive. I mean, these, these are facilities that produce the, 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 the backbone of our economy, materials that go into uh, all of our infrastructure and our clean technology. I mentioned that solar panels are 85% aluminum. There's also a lot of steel that goes into our wind and solar. Um, and so we have to produce these uh, materials more cleanly. Right now, they're, uh, in, they're, uh, many of them are made in China um, with a much higher degree of climate pollution. What the IRA proposes is to make those materials here. And that $6 billion is invested not only to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions that come out of those facilities, but the air pollution as well, that disproportionately impacts black folks and communities of color and other low-income communities. Uh, meanwhile, uh, that will invest in uh, good paying jobs in these same facilities, including in your home state of Alabama and in many others across the country. Thank you, and I yield back the balance of my time. Mr. Kustoff is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for calling today's <laughs> hearing, and thank you for the witnesses for appearing today. Uh, Dr. Jen, if I could with you, and, and some of these figures have been cited previously, but if I can, and I may be covering ground that's covered, but maybe a little bit more in detail. Okay, great. So when the CBO issued its <laughs> forecast and they, uh, their number was 391 billion, we've, we've heard about Goldman Sachs, that they, they see the total cost of the green credits as exceeding a, a trillion, and, and we've talked about Credit Suisse. If I can to you, um, somebody who's been an OMB and budgeted, how did, how did they get it so wrong? <laughs> Where, where's the disconnect? Congressman, it's a great question. Um, and it's one that I think is, is kind of a common problem when we score some of these or they score some of these at CBO without looking at dynamic effects. And they look more at the static analysis. Um, whenever you throw this kind of money at particular things, this, this being EV batteries, what do you get? You get more of it <laughs> and on the back of taxpayers. Um, and you know, one thing that I've heard quite a bit today is that this is an investment for the future. Um, but government can invest. Government only spends other people's money. Um, it's not their money to invest at the, at the end of the day. With that money, it should be in the private sector 
where you can have, allocate resources better along the way. And so whenever you're looking at what the CBO did, there's a lot of new data that's come out since they made these estimates last year, $391 billion, uh, or sorry, the $30, $30 billion, um, that was the overall amount, but the, the $30 billion here just for the EV batteries. Uh, the, that new information, with the, the number of batteries that are being um, built, and some of the changes that have been made at Treasury since then, the rules that have been put in place, that has increased the cost dramatically to where closer to the $200 billion mark, almost seven times greater than what they estimated last year. Uh, you may be saying this. I'm going to ask this in a different way. Uh, in theory, if this were being scored today, based on what we know, based on some of the things you just talked about, um, obviously it wouldn't be $391 billion. Correct. Okay. Yeah, and it might be a number closer to what Goldman Sachs has, has concluded. I believe so, yes, sir. Um, and that's one reason why you know, we're looking at America's tax reform to have this re-estimated based on the latest information that's available, um, potentially even having a pause of some of this that's going out there. I mean, something needs to be looked at because this was sold as a, an amount to the American people. And the amount that's actually going out the door of their tax dollars, it's all adding to the national debt, interest on the national debt, and so forth, um, is not that amount anymore. And so we need to have a close look at these dollars. All right. So let's assume, uh, let's assume there's another review, whether it's ATR, whomever, CBO uh, came out with a different number. Um, and the number came back along the lines of, of again, what Goldman has talked about in, in Credit Suisse. What remedy or remedies should Congress look at? Congress, that's an, another great question. I mean, this is currently the law of the <laughs> land. So, I, you know, you have to look at that and say, okay, should we pass another law that starts to strip some of this out with these tax credits, EV tax credits, or something along those lines? I think it would need to be some form of a legal change um, along those lines. Thank you. Um, if I could, just briefly, I want to read you a portion from a Forbes magazine article dated February 24th of this year. Quote, Chinese company in the green energy space are allowed federal tax incentives and other benefits to the tune of millions of dollars thanks to the Inflation Reduction Act passed by Congress and signed into law by President Biden last year. If you're making solar panels or EV car batteries, the government will help you. This, that includes China's companies. From tariffs to product dumping and commercial lawsuits, solar is the one China sector under constant pressure from U.S. trade law, yet the U.S. taxpayer will subsidize them anyway. Um, number one, do you think that's accurate, Dr. Jin? And, and two, if it is, who are the biggest losers under the Inflation Reduction Act? Congressman, the, the benefits have certainly went more towards upper income folks, larger businesses. They're the ones that are benefiting from the Inflation Reduction Act. It's, it's, it's not the families. I mean, they're getting hit hard by this of increased inflation. I mean, I think this is a misnomer. It's, it's, it's so called the Inflation Reduction Act, but it's contributing to more inflation, increasing the debt and things of that nature. Um, and it's also counter to economic growth. In fact, it, maybe it should be called the Inflation Recession Act because that's ultimately what we're getting from it. Thank you. My time has expired. I yield back. Mr. Arrington is recognized. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, uh, panelists. I'm especially delighted that we have a Red Raider uh, trained, I uh, think, engineer here. And so I know I can trust your numbers, Mr. Jen. Economist, not engineer, but economist. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Reckham. Reckham. Um, look, I'm the budget chairman, and my perspective may be a little different than some of my colleagues. I want to talk about the overselling of the so-called Inflation Reduction Act. Hopefully we can all agree that was false advertisement and mis mis misleading the American people uh, with respect to the outcomes. Secondly, the underscoring of the so-called Inflation Reduction Act and the impact on our nation's financial health, which is in serious decline and what our children will inherit in terms of the amassing debt, or what I call deferred tax, on our children as a result of passing 
the IRA <clears throat> under certain cost assumptions or budget assumptions. Today, the debt for this great country is 25% larger than the entire economy of the United States, the largest economy in the world. Two years under this administration and my Democrat colleagues, 10 trillion in spending, 6 trillion of which was deficit spending adding to the national debt in a volume we have never experienced in the history of this country. CBO projects will add $20 trillion more based on current policy. They say we'll double the annual deficit. They say we'll triple the interest payments. In 10 years, we'll be paying a trillion and a half. But in February, and this was the last time they revised their numbers was May of 22, but in February of this year, they said we have to upwardly revise the projections of the cumulative deficit based on the policies of this administration and the cost of those policies along with the interest cost, which I would submit are, are, are soaring because of the spending induced inflation. They had to revise in just a, several months the cumulative deficit by $3 trillion based on spending and interest cost. $3 trillion. <clears throat> um, this bill that was advertised as a deficit reducer, not a deficit increase, was included $400 billion of climate-related policies, main, mainly tax-related, $100 billion in expansion of government subsidies for health care. I would submit to you that the pay-fors that CBO scored to give this a deficit reduction number of $155 billion, they were, some of them were total gimmicks. Others, you could debate whether they were a gimmick like the IRS and 80 billion dollars and 87 billion in IRS agents, but there was a rebate rule that never went into effect from the previous administration that would have cost 122 billion according to CBO, never implemented. That was just a cost on a piece of paper if you implement. That was used to supposedly offset the cost of IRA. So I, I don't even believe it was cost neutral Certainly, I don't believe it was going to reduce the deficit even before this conversation. Now we're talking about this underscore of tax credits for green industry, batteries, solar, electric vehicles. We could be talking, Mr. Jen, Dr. Jen, about hundreds of billions of dollars more on the debt and this unsustainable trajectory and the potential of a debt crisis for this country and the enormous recklessness and the burden we're putting on our children. Dr. Jen, is it hundreds of billions? Is, is what I'm saying uh, jiving with your uh, economic analysis? Congressman, yes it is. I mean, I think this will be hundreds of billions of dollars added to the national debt. There were a lot of gimmicks that were in there with CBO's estimates. Some of them weren't out for a 10-year budget window that they were looking at, what those cost estimates were going to be. Um, I remember, you know, if we had done something like that in the Trump administration, we would have heard that a lot in the media, and we haven't heard any of that <laughs> going on with, within this um, so-called Inflation Reduction Act now. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you. Ms. Del Bene is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for everyone for being here today. Um, some of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle can't even agree that we're in a climate crisis, so I guess it's not surprising that they're holding this hearing attacking the single most important federal investment we've made in fighting, in fighting climate change. It's critically important to me that we ensure a livable planet for future generations, and that's why I worked so hard with my Democratic colleagues last Congress to enact the Inflation Reduction Act. 
And through the IRA, we're investing in American goods and American jobs. And the benefits from these investments are already having a tangible impact on families in our communities. Um, Mr. Beachy, thank you for sharing your expertise with us today. Um, in passing the Inflation Reduction Act, Democrats sought to address climate change, create jobs, and advance equity. And I wondered if you could explain how it's possible for a single set of investments to achieve all of these three goals. Thank you. Appreciate the question. Um, a single set of investments achieving multiple of our society's largest goals is the secret sauce of industrial policy. Uh, after decades in which industrial policy was seen as a four-letter word, uh, we have the IRA offering a historic course correction by investing in industries that are strategically imperative, not only for our climate action, but also for a more just and thriving economy. Uh, and this rebirth of U.S. industrial policy is really long overdue. Uh, I can name one example. There are a lot of examples in the law um, that talk about how, that show how we can achieve climate jobs and justice goals at the same time. One is the, the program I just named uh, in response to Congresswoman Sewell's question, a $6 billion investment in clean manufacturing. The guidance recently came out from the Department of Energy for this program, uh, suggesting that the businesses that will be prioritized for receiving uh, federal investments uh, to make our, clean, our aluminum, steel, and cement more cost competitive and cleaner uh, will be those companies who not only reduce their greenhouse gas emissions, but also cut local pollution, including air pollution, also engage meaningfully with community groups and unions, also create high quality jobs, also sign community benefit agreements to ensure that local communities and workers are getting real health, economic, and environmental benefits from those investments. Now that might seem like a very long checklist, uh, but the, the secret here is that those are mutually reinforcing criteria offering a potential for uh, overlapping wins. And when we see opportunities for win-wins, seizing them as simply smart strategy. As one example, 60% of our unionized steel and aluminum plants in this country, all of which are very high greenhouse gas emitters, uh, are also located in disadvantaged communities, the communities that have been hardest hit by the unjust status quo. Investing in those facilities offers a win-win-win opportunity for cutting a major source of greenhouse gases, for investing in good, high-paying union jobs, and for redressing historical injustices. That's one example. Um, thank you. Um, you know, this has been critical legislation, and unfortunately, um, we've seen ongoing efforts by my colleagues on the other side of the aisle to repeal all or some of the Inflation Reduction Act, um, and most recently through the Polluters Over People Act uh, last month. Um, I want, you, know, you talked about some of the investments that have already been announced as, the, as a result of the Inflation Reduction Act um, and the impact its potential repeal could have on our climate goals, the American energy industry and jobs, and on energy prices for American families. Can you talk about what the impact would be if, that le if the legislation was repealed? Well, we certainly don't see repeal in the offing because uh, voters don't tend to reject job creating proposals. Voters don't tend to reject proposals that uh, allow them to breathe clean air. Voters don't tend to reject proposals that allow us to make the technologies of the future. Those tend to be popular. And I would, if we look at the numbers just so far, I mentioned that uh, the, the report that in the first six months, new investment announcements will create over 100,000 manufacturing jobs. I mean, those are spread across the country. You know, 20,000 of those jobs are in Kansas, 16,000 in Georgia, 11,000 in Tennessee, another 11,000 in Arizona. I, I do not think voters will reject that job creation. Thank you, um, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Mr. Fitzpatrick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think the sooner off that we all uh, start rejecting this false narrative that you have to choose between energy independence and environmental preservation, the better off we're going to be. Uh, that is not a mutually exclusive choice. You can accomplish both. Um, I am a huge conservationist, a huge environmentalist. Uh, however, I voted against the Inflation Reduction Act for the very reason that uh, many of my colleagues here are offering up, that you can't ignore the impact of dealing with a nation like China has a negative impact uh, on our environment. Um, 
I'll, I'll, I'll ask, uh, I suppose, Mr. Mr. Ginn, um, is it not common knowledge that um, auto manufacturers that qualify for the EV production tax credit can claim the credit even if they license their technology directly from Chinese companies? I believe that's correct, um, Congressman. I, something else that I think was mentioned earlier, too, is a lot of these tax credits are going to financial institutions. <laughs> um, and so why are we continuing to prop up different areas of our, of our economy? Uh, it doesn't make sense, and especially if some of that's going to places like China or others that haven't been very friendly with us for a while. And, and they're, China's dominating the, the battery, battery manufacturing market. According, according to the uh, International Energy Agency, uh, this was last year, or two years ago, rather, the most recent uh, year they have data for. China produced about 75% of the world's lithium-ion batteries. That's compared to 7% produced by the United States, 75% to 7%. And yet, my reading of the Inflation Reduction Act, which I believe is accurate, uh, will only continue to help these Chinese battery manufacturers benefit through the collection of royalty payments that are funded by the American taxpayer. Uh, and yet, inexplicably, uh, the administration proceeds full steam ahead on implementing these troubling provisions of the IRA. Uh, and it's the troubling provisions that we're, we're zooming in on here, uh, which in turn financially benefits Chinese companies rather than focusing on protecting, promoting, and growing American manufacturers here at home, where we have fair labor, labor standards, where we have environmental protections, which they have neither of in communist China. Uh, my last question, Mr. Ginn, uh, what is, uh, if you could just opine or provide your reaction to uh, the issue that I'm raising, Chinese battery manufacturers profiting off of the U.S. taxpayers. Congressman, it's, a, it's an unfortunate scenario, situation that shouldn't exist. This should not be on the back of taxpayers, especially with our fiscal crisis the way that it is right now. I mean, I think that's the or the largest threat that we have right now moving forward and what that's going to mean to not only us and our grandkids, and yet we are funding um, Communist China and others through the process of the EV batteries. What happens to the lithium whenever these batteries are done? That's a whole other environmental issue that's going on. What about the particular matter that's been on the decline for many years in the United States, along with CO2 emissions going down in the United States, uh, compared with a lot of these other countries? And you're, you're contributing to them building more in countries, as has been mentioned here before, that do not have the same sort of environmental rules and regulations and just cleanliness like we have that, that's also provided by systems that are more based on free market capitalism and not by government direction socialism. How would these lithium ion batteries be disposed? It's a great question. I don't have all the details on, on that one, but it's, it's not pretty from what I understand. It's not, it's not something that actually degrades um, like other types of uh, issues there. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Stubbe. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. President Trump said, I don't want American, America to be energy independent. I want America to be energy dominant. To accomplish this, Trump lifted drilling restrictions, sped up fossil fuel production, gave the green light to domestic pipelines, blocked extreme environmental regulations, and reduced reliance on foreign oil. The U.S. was producing more oil than we were consuming and producing more oil than Russia and Arab nations. Once Biden took office, we went from energy independence to energy dependence. Biden reversed almost all of Trump's policies by focusing on climate change, wind and solar power, and electric vehicles. After Biden's action, gasoline prices rose more than $5 a gallon, which was a direct result of his green energy policies. A Goldman Sachs report projects that green subsidies in the Inflation Reduction Act will cost $1.2 trillion, more than three times what my Democratic colleagues claimed. The Wall Street Journal stated, the Inflation Reduction Act may go down as one of the greatest confidence tricks on taxpayers in history, and my colleague Mr. Estes uh, put that article into the record. The Congressional Budget Office forecast that the Inflation Reduction Act's energy and climate provisions would cost $391 billion between 2022 and 2031. But this appears to be a huge underestimate. By Goldman's estimate, the Inflation Reduction Act tax credits will cost tens to hundreds of billions more than CBO estimated over 10 years. The forecast misses include electric vehicles, green energy manufacturing, renewable electric electricity production, energy efficiency, hydrogen, biofuels, and carbon capture. 
Biden's disastrous climate policies and his environmental, social, and governance standards are crippling the United States economy. Uh, Mr. Turner, can you elaborate on these statistics and its effect on the U.S. economy? Congressman, thank you for the question. Uh, you, you absolutely nailed it, especially when it comes to oil and gas production. Uh, um, you know, for, for years we heard this talking point, 9,000 leases, 9,000 leases. How come they're not using the 9,000 leases? Well, the Willow Project was a wonderful example of that, and I am glad the Biden administration gave approval for this huge oil and gas lease on Alaska's North Slope. I've been to Willow several times. I'll be back in a couple of months. But that was an example of one of the 9,000 leases that still requires government cooperation. And we don't have government cooperation operation from this administration. For every one willow, there are hundreds and hundreds of other companies waiting just to produce oil and gas. And instead, the Biden administration makes deals with Venezuela. We make deals with OPEC. The president himself goes to Saudi Arabia to ask for oil. I just want to know why the American oil and gas workers have to suffer while we, we look to other countries, some of them hostile, for our energy needs. Thank you for that. I agree with you 100%. In 2018, the USTR, as part of an investigation under Section 301, concluded that China engages in forced technology transfer, theft of US IP and trade secrets, discriminatory and non-market licensing practices, and state-funded strategic acquisitions of US assets. USTR then imposed tariffs on an estimated 370 billion worth of US imports from China. China countered with tariffs on 10, 110 billion worth of US products. Most tariffs remain in effect today. China's imports from 2020 and 2021 fell below its commitment to buy at least 502 billion of U.S. goods and services over two years. In 2021, China's global exports grew by 30 percent over 2020. Its exports to the United States grew by 28 percent over 2020. China is pressing the USTR to lift U.S. tariffs while sustaining its concerning practices. Mr. Stein, what actions are needed to address China's trade coercion and efforts to sidestep U.S. policies? I think that's uh, it. It has to work at multiple levels. Like there's certainly there's there's opportunities uh, through the WTA and through retaliatory tar tariffs uh, to approach these things. There's also legal mechanisms. There, Chinese, these Chinese companies tr invest in the United States, and we don't have to let them do so if they're not competing fairly uh, in their home countries or even in third-party countries. Many of my Republican colleagues have expressed concern about the irregularities in economic ties, U.S. ties to PRC firms violating human rights, and China's practices that may force or unfairly incentivize the transfer of U.S. technology and data to China. These issues are evolving into broader concerns about U.S. competitiveness and national security. Uh, Mr. Horn, can you provide types of Chinese threats and or national security implications with green credit access? Congressman, anytime we allow Chinese subsidized or owned entities into the United States, we have to assume that they are not only stealing IP, they're collecting intelligence, and they're finding ways to use every piece of our system against us. My time's expired. Thank you for the witnesses for being here today. Mr. Evans. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Rather than promoting fossil fuel and the aggressive pursuit of deregulation, I stand with my Democratic colleagues and understand that we must continue investing in a more substantial future. This is the best approach to revitalizing communities and neighborhoods in Pennsylvania and across the country. So far, the Inflation Reduction Act has invested or working to revitalize communities across the country. The Inflation Reduction Act green tax credits are helping address climate change by supporting renewable energy technology. These green investments carry domestic contact requirements that will strengthen U.S. manufacturing and our nation chains. These green investments also help prevailing wages and apprenticeship requirements that will support our American workers' needs. Mr. Bailey, how can you, with the Inflation Reduction Act, help address environmental justice that has hurt, that has hurt communities of color in low-income neighborhoods? Thank you for the question. I appreciate it. 
Um, I'm, I mentioned before that we, of course, do not speak on behalf of environmental justice groups, but we gladly partner with them um, and as they are leading on making sure these investments do support communities that have endured decades of environmental injustice. There's the Justice 40 initiative, which says that at least 40% of the benefits from these investments uh, need to go to the communities that have been hard hit by years of disproportionate exposure to air pollution, water pollution, and other environmental hazards. That applies across a whole slew of programs. Then there are specific programs that offer very specific benefits to communities that have endured environmental injustice, economic injustice, and racial injustice. One of them, for example, the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, uh, which has about $7 billion designated for competitive grants specifically for uh, low-income and disadvantaged communities for, with a priority for like community solar and other investments. There's another $8 billion in there for financial and technical assistance for these same communities. Another program, environmental and climate justice block grants. For the first time, the government is as, as investing real money in communities that are disproportionately exposed to both environmental injustice and climate impacts uh, by, by providing block grants for communities to decide how they can best spend these investments. Um, they, they can invest this money in reducing air pollution, in uh, remediation of, of toxic sites, um, as well as investments in low emissions technologies that will support both jobs, clean air, and a livable climate. I'd like to ask you a follow-up. <clears throat> we know that a lot of Inflation Reduction Act subsidies go to business initially, but Mr. Billy, how can workers and communities secure economics and environmental benefits of the Inflation Reduction Act? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so as an example, many of the investments I've been talking about in clean manufacturing will go first to businesses. Uh, at the same time, uh, the Biden administration has been making clear <clears throat> that the businesses that will be prioritized for these investments are those that sign, uh, that, that partner with unions and, and ensure high road jobs, and also that sign community benefits agreements with both workers and communities. And what community benefits are, they're legally binding agreements between the company and the local workers and local communities to ensure tangible economic, health, and environmental benefits on the ground, both for the workers inside the factory and for the communities living outside the factory. You know, we have existing examples of these community benefits agreements. They can include local hire provisions, targeted hire for workers of color, for women, for other underrepresented workers. Uh, they can include community uh, business investments into a community controlled fund, reductions in air pollution, higher labor standards. It is, at the end of the day, a binding legal agreement that puts communities and workers in the driver's seat of determining the path of these investments. And it's actually being attached to many of these investments that are going to businesses. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. You back the balance of my time. Ms. Tinney is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the witnesses today. Uh, I've heard it said by my colleagues across the aisle that I, I just call it the Inflation Act and the Green New Deal because that's what it was touted as even before it was uh, signed into law, uh, represents an attempt at industrial policy. Uh, if so, it's, I think it's a pretty poor attempt. The truth is this isn't industrial policy, it's ideological policy. Uh, the industrial policy would be bipartisan, and this was not a bipartisan act, which is why we're trying to fix this today. Uh, it would be well thought out. It'd be to pro have proper safeguards in place to ensure adversaries did not benefit it. Well, we know that didn't happen. So the Democrats failed on all three fronts. Perhaps the most concerning of all is China will reap significant rewards from the Inflation Act, Green New Deal, as I call it. Uh, foreign entities of concern, including those controlled by the Chinese Communist Party, will receive billions of U.S. tax dollars under this giveaway program. It's difficult to imagine anything more irresponsible than forcing U.S. taxpayers to fit the bill for subsidies flowing directly to those controlled by the Chinese Communist Party. On top of that, the Biden administration is hard at work creating additional loopholes that will benefit foreign companies at the expense of workers here in America. Instead, America should be working to become energy independent, not rewarding bad actors like China, as you've heard my colleagues talk about intellectual property theft, spy balloons, TikTok. Um, and industrial policy is fundamentally about using policy to encourage investment in critical sectors of our economy. This has been done successfully in the past. And I think that we all would support and advocate for some kind of targeted industrial policy that puts American industry and, yes, American workers first. This is something both Republicans and Democrats should be able to support. And it's what many of my constituents in the rural Rust Belt region of upstate New York uh, care about. And 
we are an area that was uh, basically, you know, the beginning of everything. The Empire State has become the Exodus State. Everyone's left. They've gone to Asia. They've gone to China, and China is benefiting from our bad policies. And right now, as a state, we face among the highest tax and regulatory burdens in the country. And we, are, we have been saddled, and our taxpayers are being saddled with giving up and propping up the government of the Chinese Communist Party with their tax dollars. And for, their, you know, for industrial policy to be successful, it should be thoughtfully developed, carefully implemented, and most importantly, it should be unified. The Inflation Act, Green New Deal, as I call it, failed on all these fronts. And it was a rush piece of legislation that wasn't well understood by anyone at the time, which all of my colleagues have pointed out, the, the almost $1.2 trillion potentially, as stated by Goldman Sachs in the costs, uh, including uh, many of those responsible for drafting it, which is why it was a one-size-fits-all one uh, one uh, and one-party-dominated uh, bill. Uh, we're already seeing the negative offense effects, as, as uh, pointed out by my colleagues. Uh, the Joint Committee on Taxation scored it at $271 billion. We've seen beautiful charts showing all that, unfortunately for us, and, and, and likely a real a dynamic scoring of, of $1 trillion. Um, and it's no surprise that this uh, has been a mess uh, based on the way it was put through. So my question, and, and, and I, I, I come from an area where we are facing catastrophic changes in energy policy that will destroy the economy of upstate New York. My district in New York 24 is the largest agricultural district in the Northeast, the largest dairy district. We have very harsh winters. Uh, we have a wonderful soil and water conditions and very short growing season. Uh, and I wanted to just give my first question to Mr. Turner. Um, you talked about agricultural policy. Can you go give us just quickly, because I'm using up my time, uh, how the Chinese Communist Party's dominance in the supply chains will further be cemented by the Inflation Reduction Green New Deal and how it will affect my rural communities in upstate New York who we depend on for our for our economic strength. It's a wonderful question, Congresswoman, and, and and I say this often on social media, and I know my social media is well followed on this committee. Um, but people who have a farm like I do, you cannot find farm equipment that is hardly not made in China. Uh, giving China subsidies for more of this just puts all of our farmers at an enormous disadvantage. Uh, um, we've raised the cost of, of energy to the point that all fertilizers are more expensive. Your constituents would know as I would, hay was $7 a bale two years ago. I paid eleven seventy five dollars at the beginning of this winter. Right? I don't get any of those additional benefits when I sell my cattle. I just have to eat those costs. So all these benefits going to China are weakening American rural communities, farm communities, and energy communities. Thank you so much. And I just want to ask Mr. Stein, will the green credits in the Inflation Act Green New Deal actually make us energy independent? And how could we lower our energy costs? And I'm running out of time. So, Yep. Uh, well, clearly it's not going to make us energy independent. Uh, we're actually going to increase our dependence on China for the supplies of a lot of these things. So uh, we're, actually, we're actually eliminating our current uh, near independent security that we have from our domestic resources and changing, we're actually making, so the Inflation Act would make us less secure as far as energy goes, certainly. Thank you, I'm out of time, I yield back. Ms. Fishbach. Thank you, Mr. Chair, I appreciate the opportunity and thank you to all of the, um, all the witnesses today, I appreciate and I know it's a long haul um, by the time you get to the bottom. <laughs> But, um, you know, as we've discussed today, the so-called Inflation Reduction Act appeared to create incentives for domestic critical mineral production and domestic manufacturing. Yet instead of bolstering the American economy, the Biden administration, as, my, as many of my colleagues have pointed out, has created carve-outs and loopholes to continue our reliance on foreign countries and foreign companies. I'm especially concerned uh, with the Biden administration entering into the critical menu, mineral agreements with Japan, while at the same time continues to attack proposed copper and nickel mines located in my home state of Minnesota. Uh, Mr. Horn, is it backwards to create tax incentives for domestic critical minerals without having a regulatory process that allows for the development of the domestic critical minerals? Congresswoman, it's a, it's a very difficult situation to try and fix all at once. And while I think there's a role for ally partnerships and for trade, I think we have to prioritize what we have in this country primarily. And when you look at the geology and the massive amount of resources inside the United States, you know, we could surpass our own internal demand very easily. 
Obviously, you know, the great state of Minnesota has incredible battery material wealth, and it could be harvested and developed, refined, um, in my opinion, cleaner and in a more environmentally found, sound and responsible manner than anywhere else on the planet. Um, but it comes with challenges. And realistically, uh, especially when you're dealing with public land or other uh, government regulated entities, it, it's difficult to find ways forward with projects. I see projects every day, I talk to investors, uh, and the scariest thing that any investor will hear is that a project is on public land, to be quite frank. So while we should look to have trade agreements that expand abilities to work with our allies, you know, I've seen a lot of US-Canadian collaboration, for example, that I think is you know, fundamentally necessary, especially when it comes to defense industrial policy. We have to put the primary focus on doing the work here in the United States to create the jobs that we've referenced, to use the cleanest, most technologically advanced procedures, and to once again demonstrate to the world the right way to actually bring about this technological revolution. Thank you, Mr. Horn, and I, and I will just add, you know, if we, if we want to become independent, we need to make sure that we are using all of those resources and that we do it in a responsible manner, I, you know, it, making sure that we are addressing that and that the regulatory process is reasonable when we do, when we do start to um, move towards using our own. Um, and also, I have serious concerns about the electric vehicle tax credits that were expanded in the, in the again, in the so-called Inflation Reduction Act. Um, at the time when Americans saw their grocery budgets at an all-time high due to record inflation, Democrats spent billions of dollars on tax credits that benefit the wealthiest Americans. In fact, a JCT report in 2016 found that among individual taxpayers, 78% of the EV tax credits claimed were by filers with an adjusted gross income of $100,000 or more. So we already know that the wealthiest earners would benefit the most from this tax credit. And now, because of the Biden, tax, uh, Biden Treasury Department is implementing this bill, we are learning that China will be a significant beneficiary. And I know that we talked about this, but I represent, Mr. Ginn, I represent a very rural district in Minnesota. And the median household income of my district is less than $65,000 a year. It just came out the other day. Um, but if, uh, if Chinese companies are allowed to access these tax credits, uh, this is an easy one, I think, but who will benefit more from the Inflation Reduction Act, Chinese companies or my constituents? <laughs> Congressman, it's a good question, and I believe it's the Chinese, um, but also a lot of big businesses here. A lot of financial companies are also getting a lot of these from the equity that that's built into the, the tax credits. Um, and so it, very little of it will trickle down, if you will, to the rural areas um, to benefit them. And, and thank you, Mr. McGinn. Uh, I, think, uh, I think they will continue to experience those uh, those issues with inflation and their grocery costs without seeing any of the benefits of this so-called Inflation Reduction Act. So thank you, and with that, I, re I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Chair, may I have one quick moment to, to, to address something the Congresswoman very said, because quick. I think it's very important. Thank you, sir. Um, from Minnesota, the two largest copper deposits found in American soil are Minnesota and Alaska. This administration is pushing electric vehicles. Fine. Their, their standards last week pushed by the EPA want two-thirds of electric vehicles to be EVs. The average EV has 60 to 80 pounds of copper. So they are saying we need copper, and yet the same administration that is pushing us to use EVs and copper is denying us the permission mission to open copper mines in America. So that is not a sane policy. And if you are a miner in these two areas that you said are rural and need the jobs, you have to scratch your head and say, where is the, the sound policy coming when it comes to this, this issue? And thank you, Mr. Turner. You put a bow on it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Byer. You're recognized now. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. And I really want to thank the witnesses for your testimonies were fascinating. I really have learned a lot from your answers and to my Republican friends, too. Um, and I want to address one thing that's come up again and again, which is the impact of the last 40 years on rural America. And I don't want to oversimplify, but for the sake of the five minutes, you know, impact number one was um, globalization and the free trade agreements. We had CAFTA and NAFTA under Clinton. We had Chorus under George Bush. Um, we had USMCA under Donald Trump. 
uh, and many others along the way. That and add to that technology, because I've been visiting manufacturing firms for 50 years, and 50 years ago there were a lot of people in them, and now there are very few people in them because of the impact of technology. Um, so that's, that's part one, which is why, even though we struggle with it, you know, President Biden's commitment to a worker-centered trade policy was trying to reconcile our commitment to global trade with the fact that we have to defend American jobs at the same time. And the second half is what's happened to fossil fuel, and specifically coal. I was Lieutenant Governor of Virginia for eight years, so I spent nine and a half years going to the coal fields. And even 40 years ago, it was really tough. The coal companies were going broke. They moved to long wall mining, which eliminated lots of jobs. The coal companies that existed couldn't pay for the health care and the retirement benefits. And we spent, uh, and then climate change comes along, and we, we have the trade off between protecting those coal miners, um, whom we love, um, and protecting the planet and all the people who live everywhere else who, who are you know, really hurt by it. And that's not easy. Um, so, and we've struggled with it for a long, long time trying to figure out how do we bring up rural America back. The, the easiest throwaway is broadband, well, which we're all committed to, um, but it's much more than that, and education, which we're all committed to. Mr. Beachy, what's in the IRA that would actually help rural America adapt to the world we live in today? I appreciate the question. Um, let me first concur with uh, the deleterious effects of our trade agreements under the status quo, under both uh, Republican and Democratic administrations. Um, we have seen trade agreements that have incentivized the outsourcing of our manufacturing uh, to countries with lower labor and environmental standards, uh, contributing to both to job loss here um, and greater climate pollution. Uh, that actually, an uh, underreported element of that is that um, when uh, the most emissions intensive factories in the world produce the steel and aluminum of the world, it means an increase in global industrial emissions. And the IRA aims to fix that by investing in clean manufacturing of bedrock materials like aluminum, steel, and cement in this country. To your question of hard hit communities, I named earlier that there's, uh, I come from West Virginia. Um, I take the question very seriously, as do many. Um, and up, up until now, it has been a lot of talk. Um, the IRA recognizes one essential truth, which is that um, while there's been a lot of hand waving in the past, assuming that technological shifts will just naturally take care of workers and communities, uh, we know that's absolutely not the case. Some communities and some workers are indeed left behind uh, when, the, when policy allows them to be left behind. The IRA takes a step in the right direction by dedicating funds, $4 billion under a manufacturing program, a bonus tax credit for the wind and solar developments, um, a, a, a loan program worth $250 billion in loans to specifically invest in energy transition communities to retool uh, for the clean energy economy. And that's, that's not, those aren't words, those are actions really for the first time that we've seen in a long time. For the rest of rural America outside of energy communities, there's a $9.7 billion investment in rural electric cooperatives, allowing for rural communities to switch to clean energy, not only for the benefits for clean air and climate, but also for the benefits for jobs and economic development in those communities. There's investments for farmers to be able to increase their uh, energy efficiency, cut down their energy bills. Uh, there's investments that are uh, going throughout the heartland right now. I mentioned that of the 100,000 jobs uh, that were documented in just the first six months since President Biden signed the Inflation Reduction Act, we have a lot of them. In fact, the, the largest numbers are in rural states. My dad's from Kansas. The largest number of jobs we've seen created to date under new investments under, since the IRA was signed is in Kansas, 20,000 jobs. You used up all my time, but I'm grateful because you did a great job laying out all the positive things that have happened and much more that we need to do. I believe West Virginia is still 50th out of 50 states in per capita or family income. We would like it to be middle of the pack, and we'll keep investing in it. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Mr. Moore is recognized. Thank you, Chairman. Gentlemen, uh, thank you. Thank you for sitting through this and answering questions. Um, sometimes the five minutes goes by and you don't get to answer any questions. It's the way this place works. But welcome to the U.S. House of Representatives, a lovely place of constant contradiction. Uh, just today we've seen, not related to this, but you know, we saw an argument about, you know, we cannot default. So one side of the aisle says we can't default, and the other side of the aisle says we absolutely cannot default. So let's do a bill that ensures that we pay our 
bonded indebtedness to our creditors, and then the other side will say, well, you just want to pay our creditors only, um, or certain creditors more. Like it, it, It's just this constant back and forth. And I actually relate that as an example to what we're dealing with here with respect to trying to embrace an, an all-the-above approach energy process. Right? I have never been against you know, the concept of, of, of building an all-the-above approach, right? And a lot of the things in the Inflation Reduction Act, we're, we're trying to get to that. But the lead person on this, and President Biden, when he stands in front of the entire country and says, well, yeah, we'll need oil and gas for 10 more years. Like, I, I don't, I've, never seen a, I've never seen any type of predictions that can say that we can, we can meet our energy demands with just 10 more years of, ener of oil and gas. And I, I just met with a renewable gas um, organization that, was, would, 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 that, that are digging into this issue and, and talking about all the amazing benefits that we get from, from natural gas. And so, again, HR1 becomes this debate. Personally, I hope that in this split government situation, we're able to find an opportunity from uh, permitting reform. I believe there are se several Democrats, many Democrats, that would be open to the concept of permitting reform uh, because it is stymieing anything that they're, that they're doing on renewable technology. We can't even build transmission lines because of NEPA and the archaic version of, of how we go about that regulation. And so with that, I, Mr. Horn, I kind of wanted to just to hear your thoughts on the ability to meet these demands. If there is such, an, is such, a, such a motivation to, 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 to produce solar panels, wind turbines, batteries, EVs, transformers, do we have the regulatory environment to produce the material needed for that domestically? Congressman, the, the regulatory environment is not easy to work with, to state the obvious. What I would say is we have the resource and technological capability to not only meet our own demand, but to export to the remainder of the globe if we were to unleash those resources. What I do believe is that there can be a truly bipartisan agreement on common sense regulatory reform that really looks to prioritize what is best, not only for industry, for jobs, for possibly exploitable populations, but for the environment as well. Because I think when you actually contrast, you know, to the earlier example, a, a copper mine in Minnesota with slave child labor in Congo that is being propped up artificially by our largest adversary, uh, there's really no question as to which of those is preferential for all of our goals. So I would say there needs to be a hard look at regulatory reform in terms of opening up U.S. resources. And if we do that, we can once again lead the world in this space like we did prior to the 1990s. Mr. Stein, it's easy to see why uh, you know, using American minerals helps American companies. It's easy to see why it could help produce some of this technology that so many people want to embrace. What about the consumers? How does it, uh, can you describe how it will help consumers to, 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 to embrace uh, American-made or American-produced minerals more? Well, I think uh, ultimately consumers are uh, American citizens who get those jobs um, and those communities, the funds that go into those communities, that helps consumers uh, to purchase those products. So, I mean, and ultimately, uh, the sorts of efficiencies that we might look for to lo ultimately lower prices for some of these things like EVs that are still very expensive, that sort of innovation um, might happen in the United States in a capitalist uh, you know, economy, but if it was allowed for the market itself to actually take that action. When, this is part of the problem when you have government subsidies creating things. They prop up existing technologies, existing ways of doing things because companies chase the money instead of innovating and looking for the next big thing, something that might actually lower costs. Thank you. And uh, I'll just quickly make a comment to Mr. Turner, your comment earlier about the 9,000 leases. It's something I've dug into. I've actually put legislation that would require a specific timeline and process that you need to follow for things that are like are existing. So the Biden administration says, okay, we're gonna stop doing it entirely, federal lands, secretarial, secretarial order, all that stuff. And then, oh, but we have all these leases available. And then the slow playing happens. And that is the most fundamentally 
difficult thing for our, for our industry to actually navigate, and I think it's one of the most disingenuous things. So I appreciate you highlighting it, and if the leases are available, well then let's embrace it, let's continue to do it, but then it's, the, it's more of the slow playing and the constant, you know, all, all the roadblocks that get put in the way, and, uh, and, and we're left with an impossible uh, environment to navigate, so thank you. Ms. Steele is recognized. Thank you all the witnesses today, and thank you Chairman Smith for hosting this hearing. It should be alarming to all of us that the Chinese Communist Party now develops a majority of the world nickel, cobalt, lithium, graphite, and manganese, and rare earth minerals. Manufacturers need these raw materials to produce the clean energy future, but the United States has tied its own hands with restrictions that make it impossible to access our own natural resources. The Inflation Reduction Act has forced our allies to make difficult decisions about investments in the United States, and many are being forced out of the United States market because the administration has not included a realistic transition period for implementation. Ms. Turner, We've heard today about significant investments been made and jobs created to be able to claim the tax credits available through IRA, but how can this growth be sustainable if we are missing the first step, having the natural resources available to continue to produce the products American and international customers need. Thank you, Congresswoman. It's a wonderful point. It, it's the equivalent of celebrating the fact that we're opening up lemonade stands, but we don't have any lemons, right? And so saying we're going to have all this processing, manufacturing, very good. I want manufacturing in America. I want processing in America. But if the rare earths, if the metals, the minerals are all found in other countries, then how valuable, how sustainable is that manufacturing? And to highlight that, all of these metals, rare earths, metals, materials, et cetera, are found in America. America, as, as my colleague right to my left just said, we could sustain our own economy and export to our allies if only we were allowed to unleash the fullness of our potential. Thank you for that. In California, we have over 1,000 applications to drilling in California. 20% of the oil is actually coming from Russia. And since 1994, not even one permit were given out. So in my home state, the California Air Resources Board last year approved a new rule that would require 100% of new light and medium duty vehicles sold in within California to be zero emission vehicles by 2035. And now the EPA has announced that up to 60% of 2030 models and two, -third, two thirds of 2032 models sold nationwide need to, to be zero emissions. California's electrical grid cannot provide enough electricity to power all these vehicles because we have rolling blackouts. Do you have any concerns that these progressive zero, zero emissions proposals from the EPA and California um, Air Resources Board? Yes, Congresswoman, and these goals are so far in the future that's because they are absolutely not achievable. Uh, they are not achievable by market forces, they are not achievable by, by technological forces, and we do not have the grid infrastructure to have a quote-unquote uh, electric vehicle uh, a fleet. And so that is why they are 5, 10, 15 years, because then it will be someone else's problem. A lot of what government sometimes sadly does is create problems for future generations to deal with, and what doing this is going to have huge market implications for the combustion engine vehicles. It's going to be a huge burden on rural and lower income Americans, but it's also going to be a problem that future legislators and governors will have to deal with. Yeah, how it is low income families that they cannot afford to buy those vehicles. The CCP has misreported its carbon emissions and continues to open new coal plants. Yet the Inflation Reduction Act will pour American taxpayer dollars into their green companies. Can you explain how the CCP-backed companies will benefit from the taxpayer-funded credits and can share how this could make the CCP even more dominant in the supply chain? And we want to be dominating those supply chains, but as of now, that CCP has been, and they're very aggressive about that. 
I could definitely answer that, but I think Mr. Horn is more qualified if that's okay with sure, you. Sure, thank you. Thank you. It's, it's really quite clear, unfortunately, that the CCP knows exactly what our playbook is. They know exactly how to exploit it, and we make it incredibly easy for them. So they have realized that they can essentially create a shell company or entity that meets whatever loose criteria we currently have and completely exploit it and crush any legitimate American competition in the process. Thank you for all those answers and thank you for coming today. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Kind of what's going on in Michigan. Um, Mr. Snyder. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the witnesses for uh, being here today, for your patience and, and sharing your perspectives. Um, Mr. Horn, I, I appreciate your optimism, and I share your view that uh, we would be better served, uh, we would be well served by a bipartisan approach to addressing our challenges and pursuing our opportunities. Um, I think it's also critical. I spent my whole career uh, in business before coming uh, to Congress doing strategy, planning for the long term. I know if we are going to be successful in leading the world in the next generation and the generation after that, we need to have a long view, but also with a sense of urgency. The Inflation Reduction Act made historical and critical investments in our country's future, both from a climate perspective and in our economy. Heeding scientists warning the Biden administration and the 117th Congress set our, con our country significantly down a path towards net zero emissions by 2050 through the passage of the IRA and the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. A study by the National Renewable Energy Laboratory evaluated the impacts of these two laws and what they will have on our utility sector and demonstrated that clean electricity, thanks to the efforts of the prior Congress, would represent as much as 90 percent of total generation in the next decade. I ask unanimous consent that this NREL report be submitted for the record. I have also heard from renewable energy companies in my district who, with assistance from the Illinois State Legislature, have spent years making progress deploying renewable energy in our state, including more than $3 billion in solar development last year alone. We will see this progress rapidly increase as a result of the IRA. These historic investments and the positive advancements and quality jobs that follow are directly at risk from the Republican political attempts to derail the IRA. According to the American clean power, in a mere eight months since we passed the IRA, more than $150 billion in utility-scale renewable energy projects have been announced. That investment is only going to continue growing. I could speak for hours here about the critical climate investments that the IRA will make. What I want to talk about today is the tens of thousands of jobs that these investments are creating. The $150 billion of investment that I mentioned, that represents at least 18,800 jobs. Mr. Beachy, to that end, you mentioned in your testimony a report from the University of Massachusetts Amherst that shows the climate investments in the IRA will create more than 9 million total jobs over the next decade. Yes, the IRA is the most historic federal investment to combat climate crisis, but it's also a huge investment in domestic manufacturing and jobs in every state and every community. Can you expand how the IRA would improve workers' access to these high-quality jobs and clean energy sectors and why it's so important and beyond that, beyond the context of climate, how the IRA is fundamentally a jobs bill? I'm happy to. <clears throat> Maybe I will start by breaking down that 9 million a little bit. Um, I mentioned uh, already that 5 million of those 9 million jobs will be going towards clean energy workers which for the first time uh, will be uh, paid prevailing wages and offered apprenticeships uh, that offer a pathway to middle class careers. Um, that's because to take, it full ex uh, to take advantage of the full extent of the tax credit, developers need to pay those wages and offer those apprenticeships. Clean manufacturing, 900,000 jobs. Uh, electric vehicles and clean transportation, 400,000 jobs. Energy efficient homes and offices, uh, another 900,000 jobs. Environmental justice and climate resilience investments, 150,000 jobs. Natural infrastructure, 600,000 jobs. You asked about uh, pathways to these jobs. Um, it's critical that apprenticeships are explicitly named as one of the criteria that developers need to meet in order to get the full extent of the tax credit because apprenticeships provide a, an on-ramp to high-quality jobs, a pathway to the middle class, particularly for workers without a four-year degree. And really for the first time, again, we are marrying investments with that pathway. Great. Thank you. Um, let me take it a little bit further and 
the consequence, ask about the consequences if IRA would be repealed, um, whether it's a debt ceiling proposal or otherwise, removing the investments that the IRA is trying to promote, what would be the consequences of that? I mentioned earlier that I do not expect voters to reject good jobs or clean air or investment in clean technologies. I'll just add to that. Um, what it would essentially mean is seeding uh, investments in the clean technologies of the future to those who are currently controlling uh, those technologies. Much has been said today about the, that the fact that there's such extreme concentration of manufacturing of clean technology in China. If that is the problem we're trying to solve for, we should try to invest in clean domestic manufacturing of clean technologies here at home. That is what IRA does. Great. Thank you. I'm out of time. I yield back. Ms. Van Dyne. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Last year, Democrats provided hundreds of billions of dollars in green tax credits to benefit large corporations and Chinese headquartered entities, even as American families, farmers, workers, and small businesses struggled under the weight and cost of increased cost of living under the Biden, Biden living crisis and broken supply chains. Democrats have prioritized their extremist climate agenda, and yet last year, when we passed the so-called I love what you called it. Not the Inflation Reduction Act, but the Inflation Recession Act. Not only did they claim that the bill would be paid for, but they actually claimed it would reduce the deficit by over $300 million. We knew in 2019 that 83% of the credits were claimed by individuals making six figures and above. And last year, Democrats decided that we needed to increase this credit even further. The electric vehicle tax credits will be a whopping $393 billion taxpayer subsidy. It's 28 times higher than the original estimate. And on top of that, we have seen analysis that the battery production of electric vehicle battery production credits projects a cost to taxpayers of over $196 billion. That's a 542% increase from the law's original sticker price. This is sold as subsidizing an emergency, I'm sorry, an emerging industry. But this bill was propping up an entire industry. Mr. Jin, you've, you've analyzed this bill and the credits on this bill. Can you talk about how these numbers got so inflated and how this bill is even worse than we thought? Yes, Congresswoman, thank you. Um, it, you know, a lot of it has to do with the changes that have happened just since last year. Whenever you incentivize something through these tax credits, you get more of them. And so there have been a lot more in projections of what the costs are going to be as far, or the, the building, the manufacturing of many of these vehicles, therefore the batteries. And so that's contributed to many more of <laughs> the kilowatt hours, you know, the $45 per kilowatt hours of these batteries and what the, is being produced. Um, multiply that by the number of new vehicles that it's expected. That's where you get the total net amount of the $196.5 billion compared to the $30 billion that was initially assumed along with some of, like we said, mentioned earlier, some of the Treasury's rules and guidance that's been put out now that has changed, that fundamentally changed the calculations that were done last year. And that's one reason why we need to have these re-estimated so we can know what the true cost is for taxpayers. Thank you for that. Mr. Horn, do these EV credits actually increase or decrease our dependence on China? Without the proper amount of enforcement and oversight, they're currently actually making the problem worse and emboldening the Chinese Communist Party. <clears throat> So what really needs to be done is closing all loopholes, avoiding any sort of workarounds or carve-outs, and truly prioritizing supporting the legitimate American opportunities that actually exist today and are not far from coming online into full-term full production. Thank you. The IRA tax credit, or uh, energy credit, I've seen the most excitement for is the Section 45V uh, hydrogen production credit. Uh, the level of the credit as per the IRA is based on the level of carbon intensity determined by life cycle analysis. And there's no reference to feedstock, fuel source in the text. So focusing on the end result rather than the source is the more uh, tech neutral approach. However, many environmental groups are hitting Treasury hard on this point and trying to get any hydrogen produced with fossil fuel disqualified now from the credit. So given that most hydrogen is produced from natural gas, this would essentially nip the technology in the bud before it even starts. So once again, we're seeing Treasury put its finger on the scale and picking winners and losers. Now, Mr. Stein, can you elaborate on how Treasury guidance could shut down hydrogen production before it even really begins? Well, the key is, is what you mentioned about life cycle greenhouse gas analysis. That's uh, really a bit of a made-up science. You can, you can decide that methane has a certain value uh, for greenhouse gas life cycle analysis. You can decide land use has a certain value. And it's very easy to put your finger on the scale if, you've got, if, if you have the ear of the Treasury officials that decide 
what counts as, as certain levels of emissions. And it's very, it's very simple to say, well, the, for instance, the natural gas production, you say that there's a certain amount of methane that's leaking throughout the system. We don't really know how much, but you say X amount, and that makes it not green enough to qualify for the credit. So um, I'm going to ask you, Mr. Turner, if you were in my position, what would your next step be? Uh, Congresswoman, I would look to unleash the full potential of America's energy, and that includes all fossil fuels, that includes all mining. If we are going to have this green transition and it's going to be forced to go by government, then we might as well take advantage of it with the jobs and the tax revenue here. Uh, my organization has put out numerous studies that show how California, Alaska have all of the metals and minerals necessary for this green transition, yet the same people pushing it are, pro uh, are prohibiting us from opening up these mines. So I would just try to get some sanity in our energy policy and say, which one is it? Are we going to go green? Then let's do it with American ingenuity, American resources, and American jobs and tax revenue. Or are we going to support communist China? Because right now we seem to be doing both. I appreciate that answer. I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Feenstra is recognized. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And uh, thank you, witnesses, for all your testimony. I greatly appreciate it. As you can see behind me, uh, as my colleague, uh, Ms. Van Dyne noted, uh, that the cost of the green tax credits far outreached the originally projected amounts. Um, Goldman Sachs noted that the advanced manufacturing credit will be about $193 million. That's five times of what it was initially, what was noted uh, by Joint Commission on Taxation. Electric vehicles is going to be about $393 billion compared to $14 billion, again, uh, noted by the Joint Commission on Taxation. I mean, this is, this is dramatic. This is huge, especially when the, the CBO said, hey, uh, the, the deficit would be cut by $238 billion. Well, if that's the case, then look at what's happening here. So all of a sudden, we no longer have a deficit. We have a dramatic increase. So, Mr. Ginn, uh, the CBO budget and the economic outlook published in February of this year did not account for these revised costs of these new gr green energy credits. So are we likely to see deficit, debt, interest payments revised upward in the next CBO update as of this result? Congressman, if, if they take an accurate analysis of the updated data, the new Treasury guidance that's provided for IRA and the EB credits and everything else, it would certainly go up. Deficits would go up, debt would go up, interest payments would go up, and that's on top of already the expectation of an average of $2 trillion per year of deficits over the next decade. And, and how does that affect our economy? Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a huge cost on the economy. It burdens us, it slows down our growth, it's higher interest rates than we would otherwise have, higher mortgage rates, higher car loan rates, just kind of through the, the process. And then, of course, if the Federal Reserve prints it, which they probably will do some of that, you'll see higher inflation than we're already having. I mean, some are saying we're having dis disinflation now. It has come off the peak from last year, but we still have 5%, the highest in multi-decades. And so I don't see that, that is, this is the bottom. There's still more to it, especially with these kind of costs down the road. Thank you, Mr. Gannon, and I agree with you 100%. We're not, we're not at the bottom. We're literally not at the bottom, and we have a debt crisis right before us. Uh, we gotta raise a debt ceiling. Why do we gotta raise a debt ceiling? Because of this, this uh, wild spending spree that has happened the last two years uh, by the Inflation Reduction Act and many other things. And, and, and we, the people, uh, the, our taxpayers, we got to pay for this. Our families that have to go to the grocery store all of a sudden are seeing an increase in eggs and you name it. They're seeing an increase in gas, right, because of this outlandish spending spree uh, that is now affecting all of us. I want to change the topic and talk about the supply chain. Um, you know, the Inflation Reduction Act, obviously, as we see on this bill, uh, on this board, uh, promoted tax credits for electric cars. All right? Now think about this. All right? Tax credit for electric cars. The, the, the EPA also just mandated that 54% of all new vehicles by 2030 must be electric. All right? All right? So there's this thumb on the scale, the thumb on the scale that says, all right, we're going to have electric vehicles. Right. A side note that really irritates me because I'm a biofuels guy and they talk nothing about ethanol and biodiesel, which just infuriates me. But anyway, the Department of Interior, all right, the Department of Interior, what did they do? They banned mining in criti critical, of critical materials in public lands. Mr. Turner, you noted that, right? This is an oxymoron. All right, we want to do electric vehicles, but we're going to ban critical materials. And then the Department of Energy on the other side, all right, this is how dysfunctional this administration is, the Department of Energy noted that four out of every five cars by 2050 will still use liquid fuels. 
what, what, how does this happen? This, this administration is clueless. I want to ask uh, Mr. Horn, Mr. Horn, and then I'll ask uh, Mr. Turner, how, how does this affect our economy when we can't buy critical materials in the U.S. and we've got to go across to China to, to make, the, make this all happen? When we're forced to buy Chinese produce commodities, materials, resources in general, it's always hurting American consumers and American manufacturers. And the, the biggest shame, just to reiterate, is that better alternatives exist inside the United States if we can simply get out of our own way. Thank you, Mr. Turner. You get Congressman, seconds. if I could leave the committee with one lasting point, it's this. We are not using fewer fossil fuels. We are just using them differently. So going green, EVs, wind, solar, whatever you want to call it, we are using as many and potentially more fossil fuels. We are just using di them differently, and we are making it difficult to bring them to, from American markets. I agree 100 percent. Thank you for both of you noting that. And we are destroying our families because they cannot afford to buy groceries. They cannot afford to buy gasoline. All right, because of this crazy idea of they all have to have a $70,000 electric vehicle. Thank you, and I yield back. Mr. Panetta is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, thank you for being here as long as you have been. I appreciate all the information that you have provided. Um, for the past few decades, I think it's clear that we have become dependent on China, unfortunately. And then you had a pandemic that definitely exposed our weak supply chains, and of course, we have the climate crisis. And so I do believe that we were left with no choice but to make such significant investments to show that we were serious about the direction as to where our economy, to where we want to go when it comes to our energy and decarbonization. But obviously, in order to do this, in order to make these advancements of what I'll call an industrial policy, our permitting needs to be streamlined. Now, in order to meet many of the goals the 2030 goals, we need to double our transmission line expansion. But to do that, it's going to be taking, it will take building massive amounts of new infrastructure on massive amounts of land that's often undeveloped. Now, currently, any approval of high voltage transmission lines across multiple states is onerous, it's litigious, and it's long, taking up to 10 years. Heck, it takes seven years to get a permit for an onshore wind farm and five years to get a permit for a solar farm. Now, what we've seen is that the permitting process has become the favored vehicle to block projects, and NEPA challenges make up the largest proportion of federal climate change litigation in the U.S., taking years longer for implementation and making it much more expensive. It's understandable, as you heard my colleague Blake Moore talk about, why there is by bipartisan consensus that it takes too long to build things in the U.S., in the belief that the permitting process is broken. That's why permit reform is a hot topic in the 118th Congress right now, because without it, we risk losing the investments that we want to make, especially with the IRA. Now, Republicans and Democrats have some ideas on reforms to permitting, such as standard timelines for environmental reviews, regional maps of areas for development rather than the Endangered Species Act on a case-by-case -case basis, empower, empowering the Permitting Council to coordinate agencies, and giving the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission power to approve transmission lines. Obviously, these are, these are big things that we have to do, though, in order to do big things, especially when it comes to our energy policy. Now, Mr. Beachy, don't you agree that we need to streamline our permitting? And if we do need to do that, how can we do it without undermining our environmental protections? Thank you for the question. I'll start by saying it is uh, that I agree with the problem. It is certainly a problem and one we must tackle. Um, before this administration, we were facing uh, several barriers to uh, achieving our climate goals while also rebuilding our manufacturing base, while also investing in hard-hit communities. Um, and I have mentioned the lack of, uh, uh, the lack of investments was certainly one of those problems, and the IRA stepped in to help fill that gap. It is not the only barrier that we face, um, and certainly I think it is widely recognized that, that permitting is a barrier. Um, our union and environmental partners are deep in discussions about the details of this right now. As you suggested, it is a hot topic. Um, and the details matter immensely. Um, 
what we do believe is that uh, any infrastructure review uh, must have ironclad commitments to uphold uh, public participation um, and strong environmental review of those projects, uh, no matter the project. Um, we also believe uh, that uh, we must swiftly deploy all of this clean energy in our economy um, so as to meet our climate goals, but also so as to swiftly deliver real benefits to hard hit workers and communities. Marrying those two will not be any easy task, which is why we are mired in the details right now. Um, so I'll just say it is a critical topic of conversation. I'm very glad Congress is taking it on, um, and it is one that we are also actively pursuing. Good, and I look forward to continuing to have these types of conversations on the, this very tough topic, but it's something that does need to be done in order for us to take advantage of the authorization that we passed last Congress, and now it's time to actually get serious about the implementation. And in order to do that, look forward to having these conversations. Thank you. Thanks to all the witnesses. I yield back. Ms. Maliotakis is recognized. Uh, thank you all for being here, and I want to thank the chairman for calling this hearing. Um, you know, here we are eight months later after this uh, bill was jammed through, or a few months later since this bill was jammed through. And, and, and what we are finding now is uh, this Inflation Act, uh, as I would call it, um, really did create inflation. It was certainly it put us in the situation we are right now where we have a debt ceiling crisis. It's crushed American energy, as is evident by your testimonies today. Um, and it has become a slush fund to benefit large corporations, uh, not just the wealthiest corporations here, but also those in communist China. It's really interesting to hear my colleagues who accuse Republicans of corporate welfare and giving out uh, benefits to the rich because they have spent hundreds of billions of dollars and provided benefits to companies where 90% of those companies benefiting have sales of over $1 billion. That's who they prioritized in this bill. Uh, meanwhile, our constituents, uh, working class Americans, are suffering greatly they're paying the price, both through taxes, uh, through inflation, through high energy costs and whatnot. Um, I, wanna, I wanna talk about not just what this bill has done um, and also what the president's anti-policies have done, but in my home state of New York, okay, um, and I fear that the country is going the way that New York has gone, and New York has closed a uh, nuclear power plant, Indian Point, which we provided 26% of the electricity for New York City. They are now denying permits for natural gas plants. They're banning gas vehicles, doing what California's doing. Uh, they want to man mandate those EVs that people can't afford because they're over $60,000 in costs. Uh, and they also now want to move towards banning stoves. And we're talking about communities in, in, in across America where 60% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. 42% of Americans say they have less than $1,000 in savings. And individually, they hold credit card debt record highs. I'm left wondering how these green credits benefit Americans, the American people that we represent. People in Staten Island, in Brooklyn, who can't afford a $60,000, $70,000, $80,000 uh, electric vehicle, while these big corporations doing business are receiving a windfall of their hard-earned money, taxpayers' hard-earned money. So I'd like to start with you, Mr. Turner, because I think you're a New York City native, if I'm not mistaken, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on, are these policies, both the federal and the state that I mentioned, are these policies the reasons that my constituents are paying more for electricity and heat? Congresswoman, thank you. Absolutely. Uh, the, the, the previous governor um, and carried out by the current governor of New York implemented a series of policies that dramatically increased the cost of electricity by eliminating coal, by eliminating nuclear, um, all what the plans, again, the future plans, one day we will build solar, one day we will, et cetera, but in the real time, the, Ameri the, the, the New Yorkers are suffering. Case in point, in 2019, uh, uh, of the, the height of, a, of the summer heat, uh, uh, Mayor de Blasio was stuck with a, a grid that was faltering. And what did they do? They turned off um, some um, specific areas of the city to protect the overall integrity. What areas did they turn off? Brownsville, East New York, close to where I grew up in Queens, mm -hmm. predominantly poor, predominantly African-American neighborhoods. The Upper East Side was fine. Soho was fine. Tribeca was fine. So, so their policies, the, the very people they claim to care about are the ones they hurt the most. Yeah, and they're also seeing high food prices as a result. 
high gas prices as a result. This is all a result of the Democrat policies that we're seeing on the state and federal level. Uh, in, the, in the Department of Defense space, the specialty metals clause has required uh, defense contractors and their suppliers to purchase cobalt-based alloys and steel products that have been exclusively produced here in the United States. Obviously, that's for security reasons. Um, Dr. Horn, this is your, I think, area of expertise. Can you uh, comment on that? And should we expand that special metals clause to, 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 um, to preclude uh, companies manufacturing with critical minerals outside of the U.S. or its partners from attaining tax incentives or credits like this. So these jobs truly stay in the United States. Congresswoman, thank you for raising this point. Uh, I, I think it's the most ridiculous idea that we would have critical defense components that we would rely on our biggest adversary for and give them the leverage that were we to get into a strategic conflict, which it's certainly possible when you have spy balloons and other things going on where <clears throat> they would have the ability to shut it off completely. If we don't have the ability to source ourselves with these critical national security and defense components, we are unbelievably vulnerable. I, I appreciate this, and I'll just conclude because I'm out of time by saying that this administration talks about made in America, and then they do the exact opposite thing. And sadly, what we're talking about today is just another example of that. And. Uh, I'm glad that you're all calling him out on it. Thank you. Mr. Kerry is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the witnesses. Um, interesting testimony. I read through them all. I want to point out a few facts, because um, those are tricky little things, aren't they? From 2005 to 2018, the United States reduced its emissions by 12% reduced our emissions by 12 percent. The rest of the world increased their emissions by, guess what, 25 percent. Now, part of the reason this happened, my dear colleague from Virginia pointed out what had happened to the coal industry. He's partially right. But what we saw was a rise in the use of natural gas to generate energy. So much so, because we can burn it very cleanly here in the United States, that my governor in the great state of Ohio, along with my colleagues in the House and Senate, actually redefined natural gas as green energy. So it makes one wonder why we talk about all of these issues, and I pointed out at the last hearing, and I'll pay it for all of you guys, China granted permits for over 106 gigawatts of capacity at 82 different sites across China. That is equivalent to starting two new coal plants a week. Put it another way, China has six times, six times many new plants that are being built than the rest of the world combined. Makes one wonder why this administration has attacked the natural gas industry so much. I want to go on to a couple things. With, on the first day, the president canceled the Keystone Pipeline, which we all know drastically increased the price of gas. We know that. We also know that we have more energy reserves than any other country in the world, and we should be focused on exploring Mr. Turner, you brought this up, exploring our natural resources along with our mineable materials. But instead, the administration has been focused on promoting these expensive renewable energies, which basically is giving China free reign. So Republicans on our side have worked very hard with HR1. I do want to highlight just a couple things because I thought it was important when we were in West Virginia, we actually, I didn't get a chance to bring this up. This administration has been in an all out war or assault on regulations. So far, and according to the Wall Street Journal, this administration has issued over 517 regulatory actions, which are costing all of us $318 billion. At this point in the Obama administration, it would be over a million, or one, 100 billion. Another 311 Biden regs are in the pipeline that will cost another 
$200 billion. 23 of the 311 regs will cost a billion apiece. This doesn't create regulatory certainty. It creates regulatory terror, and it kills jobs. And we have gone out across this country under the chairman. We've been in West Virginia. We've been in Oklahoma. We're going to be in Georgia. And we're talking to energy producers, people that work in the oil and gas fields, people that work in the coal mining and mining industry. For every one mining job, there are four spinoff jobs, domestic jobs. For every one oil and gas job, there's another job that is related. This is what grows the American economy. We don't have a revenue problem in this country. We have a spending problem. And all the charts that have shown that, we've got to get back to basics, what works, what makes America, and let's get this country moving forward. I yield back the balance of my time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Kerry. I would like to thank all of our witnesses for uh, your marathon hearing and for being here. Um, please be advised that members have two weeks to submit written questions to be answered later in writing. Those questions and your answers will be made part of the formal hearing record. And with that, the committee stands adjourned.